C-SPAN 2 is a public service created by America's cable television companies. During Campaign 96, C-SPAN 2 will provide comprehensive coverage of key congressional and state races from around the country. Here's our overnight lineup. Next, a House subcommittee hearing on the Gulf War Syndrome. About Books begins at 7 a.m. Eastern with Tipper Gore showing photos from her new book, Picture This, a visual diary. Following that, former FBI agent Gary Aldrich talks about his bestseller, Unlimited Access, an FBI agent inside the Clinton White House. And at 9, live coverage of the World Bank's annual Environment Report. Now, a hearing on Gulf War Syndrome. Thursday, a House Government Reform and Oversight Subcommittee heard from Gulf War veterans and medical researchers about health problems reported by veterans and possible exposure to chemical and or biological weapons during their military duties. This was the fourth such hearing held by Representative Christopher Shays, who chairs the subcommittee. This portion runs three hours. It took us a little later. We will have one more vote. Mr. Towns will be coming shortly, and I'll invite him to uh, uh, ask some questions. Ms. Murphy, I'm, I'm letting her know that you're coming. Ms. Copeland, I, I, I have just a few more questions um, that I, I want to ask. Um, the, um, again, the, the connection that I have and I see between the two of you is that one representing the VA and one representing uh, our intelligence community is that we know that Iraq had chemical and biological weapons. They had the capability to produce them. We know they produced them. We know that they had the experience to use them because they used it against Iran and also the Kurds. Then the next question is detection. There were various logs uh, both in Kuwait and um, in Iran, um, Ms. Copeland, that um, uh, talked about soldiers knowing about uh, warnings going off of chemical weapons. Did uh, the CIA have access to those logs? We've, we have read the logs the DOD has provided us. Okay, but only the, the logs that the DOD has provided? We have not. DOD investigates and looks at those and provides those alarm readings to us that they determine that are credible. We did not, when we did our comprehensive review beginning in uh, March 95, I think it's good to make clear that we did not begin to look at this issue until March 95. Those events, they felt credible, they passed to us, and we read. Why would you want to make clear that you didn't look at it in 95 and not 91? We started looking into the Gulf War illnesses issue in March 91. You started looking into illnesses. Correct. Right. But your testimony before this committee is... I mean, excuse me, March 95. March 95. No, I, I, I'm not yeah. trying to tie either of us up here. So March 95, why, why wouldn't you have looked at them sooner? Up until then, we were not part of the investigation. It was all DOD. We were asked to come in and make a separate, all-source intelligence look at all the intelligence information available and work with DOD as they looked at all the operational logs. When, um, <clears throat> when we hired Science Application International Corporation to um, determine what would happen if we blew up various depots, uh, the determination of this company was that the plumes, whatever danger, it would go in the opposite direction of our troops. Um, was that a CIA um, effort or a Defense Department effort? A Defense Department effort. Okay. So <clears throat> the, the CIA was not involved in issues of deciding what would happen with, with uh, blowing up a, a particular depot or depots? 
We did not do any modeling. Okay. We were not involved in the modeling. Right. Um, were you involved in determining, since it was a foreign country, uh, where the chemical weapons were? Yes, we were. Okay. Did you uh, have any evidence uh, before the war that uh, Camasia or Camasia that uh, there were uh, uh, chemical weapons? We didn't have Camasia on our list as a chemical weapons deal and ha depot and had not published it. Okay. We we didn't have. We didn't have it identified as a chemical weapons depot. How many sites uh, did you have uh, as potential chemical weapons sites in Iran? I don't know the exact number, but I can get that number back. Do you had no an approximate number? There was, there were quite a few. There were. I can get you. I can get you the exact number. Yeah. If you'd like. Okay, well, the committee would like that, but the, the quite a few is is uh, an important contribution to this committee. In other words, we knew they were in various places around the country. Um, would. Uh, um, you tell me, is the CIA involved in any way in reviewing the work of um, the Science Applications International Corporation's review of its own work? We started a, well, first of all, SAIC is not reviewing its own work. Okay, SAIC is the company, Science Applications correct. International Corporation, correct? Correct. We started a contract with them in 1992. Part of that contract in 1992 was to provide us downwind hazard information on a variety of locations. So in other words, they're, they're, they were to look at the various work that they had done before 92. That's incorrect. <coughs> That's incorrect. Explain to me why it's in Is it technically incorrect or is it incorrect? It, it's incorrect. Okay. Explain to me why. We started, our, we started our contract with them in 1992. Right. In 1995, when we started investigating whether or uh, all of the intelligence on Gulf War issues, and we identified facilities, specifically in the beginning two facilities that actually had chemical agents in them, we provided that information to SAIC and asked them to model it for us. So we provided the details on specific sites that we, through our intelligence, had identified as having chemical weapons in them when U.S. forces had bomb bombed them. Uh, let, and let me, let me back up, dates. because I may just simply uh, totally misunderstand the purpose for hiring SAIC. Uh, this was a company that both uh, Mr. Deutsch and Mr. Perry were directors of. The, qu I, I the, the question I have is... This company engaged uh, in doing modeling work to determine before the war if, in fact, we bombed some of these bunkers, uh, which way the prevailing winds would take the, the plumes and so on. Do you, SAIC did work for DOD during the war. Okay. To make those determinations and other things. You would have to ask DOD precisely what they asked okay. them to do. I understand the word precisely is important. Um, it's one reason why I would have loved to have had DOD here. Um, uh, but the company that did work before the war is now being uh, asked to review some of its own work. Is that not true? That's not true. Okay, that's what I'm missing. That's what I'm we, missing. In order to do the modeling, you have to have certain assumptions. I do not know what DOD gave them when they did their modeling. I do know what I'm giving them when okay, they no, did Okay, so the technicality modeling. is they, they did the modeling in both cases, but you're saying the data may be different. The data has got to be different. Okay, but, but aren't we kind of splitting hairs here? Aren't we kind of splitting They did modeling work before the war and made determinations. Now they're doing modeling work after the war to see if maybe they made some mistakes. That's I, that's, I feel like I'm playing a chess game with you. In order to... The model predicts a downwind hazard. Right. You have to make assumptions and give inputs to the model. If the inputs are different, you get a different model. If, 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 in, uh, so you're saying the inputs are different. So the data that's supplied is different, but the company doing the modeling is the same company. Is that not correct? That is true. Okay. Well, I'd be happy to leave it at that. I mean, I'd be happy to leave the fact that, th that the data that you had before the war might have been different than the data that you had after the war, now with, with hindsight, but it's the same company doing the modeling. That's correct. That is correct. And I have a little bit of trouble with that. And, and I have trouble with the fact that we had to take so long to get to this point in my asking of the questions. It makes me think I've got to think more clearly to make sure I'm hearing everyone.
If I'm not precise, I'm not going to learn the truth. And you want me to learn the truth. You don't want to keep the truth from me. What, what is the um, explanation of the severe mechanical failures to modeling equipment have delayed the planned schedule to conduct examinations of operations at Kamasaya? This was the letter we received from DOD. Uh, the recent storm or hurricane, um, they've lost their entire operating system and I believe the hard drive is gone and so right now they're trying to fix their computer. Is this the only company that we could hire to do this work? It is the company that we believe is the most expert to do this work. There are uh, others in the U.S. government, U.S. Army, U.S. Air Force that also have models and can model predictions. They don't use uh, some of the weather models that SAIC has developed, um, but they could do downwind hazards. Now, just getting back, and then I'm going to go back for a vote, and Mr. Towns will probably be ahead of me, and I'm just going to ask him to convene the committee uh, and not have to wait for me. Um, I am just very unclear as to why the CIA got involved in 95 and not sooner. Uh, I believe that with the incredible ability to gather intelligence that you have, it is hard for me to explain why you would not have known that there were, in fact, chemical weapons uh, in some, for instance, knowing what the Czechs had told us, knowing Kamasai, knowing about the pit that was just disclosed a few, uh, on just the night before, actually, to us. Uh, I'm having trouble with that because it undermines my confidence in your ability. Uh, it, it, it reassured me that somehow it shouldn't bother me that it took till 1995 for the CIA to have some concern that maybe there were chemicals here. Why, 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 why should that not discuss? Until 1995, DIA had the primary lead in looking at and investigating Gulf War illnesses from an intelligence perspective. Admiral Studeman, in 1995, the CIA do an independent review of all the available information. But let me understand something. You all are involved in what happens overseas. That's one of the points That's you make. Correct. So it would strike me that we have had an extensive intelligence work in Iraq. That's one reason why I think in Iran and, and elsewhere. And it's one reason why, uh, and Kuwait and so on, it's one reason why I think we were as successful as we were in the war. I give credit to some work done by the CIA in this regard. What I'm asking is, well, first I'm asking you this, not to play a game here, but you used primary lead. And I'm thinking, well, there must be another kind of lead. So let me ask you, did you play a secondary lead? No, we didn't. Okay, they did, were the lead. Okay, were you followers or you, were you not involved at we, all? We were not involved at all. We listened and looked at some of their reports, but we did no research. Okay, so you well, not involved in all is not accurate. And I'm not trying to tongue-tie you because you, you are under oath and I need to be clear here, so maybe your careful choice of words is important. You were at meetings? You just didn't do the research? What do you mean? DIA did the research, looked at all the intelligence information, and uh, we have meetings together uh, on chemical issues, and they would brief us their findings. We didn't check any of the findings. We did no independent research until we were asked in March 1995. Okay, let me ask you this, and then I'm going to go. When you say you didn't check, did, did, was the CIA... Uh, provided information that may have suggested before 95 that chemicals were in Kamasaya. The 1991 report was available to us as, as the rest of the intelligence community in 1991. So you had the information in we 1991? Sure yes, we did. And people reviewed that information? The analysts at that time reviewed the information. Okay, and what, did, what is the, what, it, when you uh, and, and Mr. Deutsch and others expressed extraordinary outrage, as I'm sure they must have, because this was in your possession. Uh, w how did they determine that this information in 1991 was not provided? We have people getting ill and dying because, in my judgment, of, of chemical uh, agents. And we have, even though you didn't want to speak to the soldiers and talk to them, they were reaching out to anyone who would listen. Now, tell me what... Uh, the, the CIA has done to try to figure out why they blew it. And that's an understatement. 
why we didn't look at the information earlier? No, you did look or at the information. You had the information, you looked at it. Nobody Sorry, acted on it. The issue is you did have the information in 1991. Pretty serious That's information. That's correct. Okay. Why didn't that analyst or someone else step forward and tell leaders that, uh, uh, that they had this information and it should be looked into? Considering that there were some mm -hmm. people like our own side, our own soldiers, who were complaining that they were uh, possibly uh, affected by chemical agents. At this time, when we got this information in 1991, it was rather confusing. We were not sure because the Iraqis had deceived us in several of the inspections. When we received this report, we didn't know for sure whether or not those munitions were moved in just prior to the inspection or if they'd been there all along during the war. So you ignored uh, the, I'm sorry. Uh, on top of that, we hadn't identified this facility as a CW facility. We had identified Nasiriya. No, but the you Iraqi, had the, this is important to understand. Sure. The Iraqi declaration had Nasiriya slash Kamasiya. We all interpreted that to be Nasiriya. So we, we had confusion on where this facility was, exactly what was being looked at, when those munitions were moved in. So, so when you have confusion, you, f you get the answer. No, and at this time, our primary goal and objective was to identify all of the filled chemical munitions and all the types of agents and facilities that the Iraqis had and give that information to UNSCOM so that they could be destroyed. That was our focus. There was no Gulf War illnesses in the time of 1991. Known, well, to us, no known illnesses to us at that time. Um, I will be back, Mr. Towns. <laughs> Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Let me just sort of uh, follow up on something that the uh, chairman raised earlier. Um, even if the CIA uh, did not accept gather the info, it must input and synthesize the DOD info, mm -hmm. right, That's in order correct. to draw conclusions. That's Is that correct. correct? That's correct. So then with that, you, have, you would have to know a little more than you're saying that you know. DOD provides us information on their investigations. They investigate it, and then we synthesize that with all of our intelligence information. That's correct. So what I'm saying is that with that alone, that you do have information a little more than you're saying that you have and you probably know a little bit more than you're saying that you know just on that basis alone I think wouldn't I mean uh, uh, I I do not believe that it is in my purview to answer DOD operational information and that's what I answered earlier my knowledge I do know the information that DOD provides to us that's correct. Okay. Well, you know, I I understand what the, ch the chairman is saying. You know, uh, you know, I think that you know we want to be open here, and uh, mm -hmm. we want to. And I rather you say I don't care to answer it, and let us move forward rather than to you know t take me around the Marburg, Mulberry bush. You know, uh, I would I would rather just say I don't want to answer it. You know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, get that information from somewhere else. Maybe it's out okay. there. I mean, I mean, I really because I mean, I you know, I think that um, uh, we need to sort of have that kind of honesty and, and be candid. But you know, and I I understand that you can't speak for another agency. But I'm saying to you that based on the structure, you would have the information, and and I think that uh, that's what I'm really saying. Mm -hmm. And I think that you you would have to acknowledge that, you know, based on the way structure. Let me just move on. You know, I'm not going to. I want to try to. Um, Stay labeled with the point. Ms. Copeland, do we know the number of troops potentially affected or the period of their exposure? I do not know that. It's better to ask DOD that question. Do we know what chemical agents the troops may have been exposed to? We do know the types of agents that they may have been exposed to at Kamasia. It was a mixture of sarin and cyclosarin, GB or GF. Let me just say that um, uh, 
the reason we're pushing this issue, you know, and I, I think you need to understand, we're very serious on this side about this. You know, lives are being destroyed. I mean, and we, we consider this as being very serious. And that's the reason why we keep pressing the issue. And uh, if you don't feel the answer to something, I mean, you know, feel free to say, you know, go somewhere else and get the information. And I'll move on. I mean, that's the kind of member I am. Mm -hmm. But I tell you now, we're not going to stop. We're going to continue to pursue this because there is a problem. I mean, there's no if, ands, and buts about it. So uh, I want to let you know that uh, it's not something that we're going to dance and go away. And I just want to say one other thing. In the last election, I got 88% of the vote. And if, even if I go down, I should be around 80 you know, percent, you know, even if I go down. And I'm sure I'll have 51 percent, so I'll be back, you know. I, 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 I'll be back. So, so I just want to sort of make that point clear. But let me, let me just sort of move on. I don't want to uh, 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 get into a whole thing here. But uh, I want to go to you, um, uh, Dr. Murphy. And I know you've um, been here several times. Uh, Mr. Roberts testified, I think it was earlier, that I think out of 399 out of outfit of 758 that were discharged, either medically or medically unfit, uh, are you aware of this kind of information? Uh, Soldiers that were identified. And let me say why I ask you that. His unit. Yes. 399 of 758 soldiers were discharged as medically. Either medically or medically unfit. They were... no, I'm not aware of that, sir. Well, let me just ask you this then. You have a registry that you mentioned. What do you have in that registry? What do you keep? I mean, what's it for? Educate me. Okay. Let's, I think the, the chairman was a little confused about what information VA has also. So let me start out by saying that we do have a roster of every single individual who is deployed to the Persian Gulf Theater of Operations. So we have almost 697,000 names and identifiers of people who are in Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Right. That is, you know, being updated on a uh, frequent basis. And we currently have over a million names because, in fact, the Gulf War period was never closed out. The Persian Gulf Veterans Health Registry is a voluntary program where we offer physical examinations to veterans who choose to come to the VA system. It allows somebody to come to the VA to get um, a physical examination and some laboratory tests and get some questions answered about their concerns um, about their health after their Persian Gulf service. If they need medical care or follow-up, we also have the ability to provide them a full range of medical services based on the priority care legislation that you and your colleagues passed. Right. So any, any Persian Gulf veteran who says that they feel they have an illness that was due to an exposure that occurred in the Gulf is eligible for VA medical care. Um, if you're asking why we don't know about these 399 individuals. That's correct. Um, the Veterans Benefits Administration could check and find out if they had submitted a claim uh, for compensation. Uh, but DOD would have to tell us that they had identified a unit that they were having literally um, half the individuals discharged on a medical basis, and they have not provided that kind of information to us. But I'll go back and check. Yeah. You know, I find myself on this side, I apologize. I don't want to uh, put you against one agency against another agency, but let me just tell you what my problem is. Now, DOD has said it did not occur. Some of these things did not occur. But the point is that you treat all. Now, uh, you and your registry and you treating people, uh, would you say that your findings is also the, it would be the same, that basically did not occur, only just a few isolated incidents that have occurred? Or would you, how would you categorize, put it, what category would you put this in? I, well, first of all, I, I don't think we're, you're asking a question about medical care, if I'm interpreting you correctly. That's correct. In terms of DOD is saying basically that a lot of this did not happen. These numbers, forget about this. This is basically what they've said up to this point. Now, you in the treatment business, so you're actually treating people. So now, would your records confirm what DOD is saying? Well, you know, certainly a number of Persian Gulf veterans have come to us uh, for health care. As I, uh, as I had previously said in my testimony, more than 60,000 Persian Gulf veterans, 10 percent, have come to the VA requesting a registry examination, and more than 187,000 individuals have come for outpatient care. So there are a number of individuals who are requesting health care services from VA, um, and I think that's significant. Number two, 
we haven't seen a consistent pattern or a, a pattern of illnesses that have, has pointed us to one organ system being affected or one disease being um, most common in this group of, of Persian Gulf veterans. We've seen a whole variety of different kinds of medical illnesses that certainly haven't suggested to us in VA that there was a definite neurotoxic exposure. I'd also like to reiterate the point that we've asked repeatedly the Department of Defense and other intelligence sources to work with us. We are a healthcare organization. I'm a physician. I want to care for my patients. And I need information to base good decisions on. We wanted information on any exposure that might be relevant to any health consequences that have occurred in Persian Gulf veterans. And, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, disappointed that we did not hear before June of 1996 that chemical weapons were released at Kamasiya because it delayed our research programs. And it did not have an effect on the health care. We delivered the health care that was necessary to these veterans, but it did delay our research activities. Uh, Dr. Dr. Murphy, how do you respond uh, to Mr. Toot's uh, uh, written statement that nearly all of the U.S. forces who served in Operation Desert Storm were exposed to chemical agents? How do you respond to that? I, I really don't know. What I can tell you as a physician and as a neurologist, if there was a nerve agent exposure, we know the kinds of symptoms that veterans should have had and the kinds of illnesses they should have developed with an acute toxic exposure to these chemicals. Um, but whether, you know, whether or not there was any widespread low-level exposure, I really don't have the expertise. That's an intelligence question. And we have the information that we have from the intelligence community. Okay. Ms. Copeland? From all the information that we've looked at, we've only identified the two facilities that were bombed. Um, our modeling indicates that there was no exposure at the general population limit dosage, which is where we modeled it to. Exposure to Hamasia is possible, and that's why we've laid out the footprint. There were agents there. Another area that's possible is the pit area, which is in Kamasia and um, close to the bunker. Uh, U.S. troops did explode chemical munitions there, so it's possible there as well. Let me, uh, you know, uh, the models are actually based on synthetic info. Is that correct? Excuse me, what do you mean by synthetic info? Oh, the information that you collect, you know, determine it with the model, right? Is that correct? Yeah, we input information into that model. Some of the models that are used, like NUC4, were developed over the years by the military to uh, look at and predict downwind uh, hazards from chemical agents, downwind patterns. What is this synthetic? But hypothetical. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, that's correct. I'm mean, hypothetical. But let me, let me just sort of move uh, 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 on, on that to some of your clinical guidelines, uh, Mrs. Murphy. How did, uh, Dr. Murphy, how you, did you develop? Did DOD uh, assist you in, in setting up clinical guidelines? No. Um, how, did it, how did it come about, your clinical guidelines? Well, actually, as I, I said, VA set up its clinical programs very early for Persian Gulf veterans in August of 1992 because of the concerns and the number of Persian Gulf veterans who had come to our VA facilities. There were three referral centers that was set up in Washington, D.C., West Los Angeles, and Houston, Texas. I was the director of one of those referral centers. And after having experience in seeing several patients, several dozen patients, um, we decided that we really needed a more consistent and comprehensive method of evaluating our patients. And the three referral center directors, um, actually headed by the Washington VA, the staff that I worked at and my colleagues at the Washington VA developed a protocol for a comprehensive evaluation. That included, uh, by the way, neuropsychological testing. And if the veterans had relevant symptoms in the neuro nervous system, neurological testing. 
um, from the very beginning, back in, in the 1993 when that protocol was first under development. In, um, at the beginning of the, the DOD CCEP program, DOD asked us to share our experience with our referral centers and our registry program, and they adopted the protocol that we had developed at the Washington, D.C. Referral Center. Um, and now we have comparable programs in VA and DOD using the same protocol that was developed by VA. Yeah. Would you consider, you know, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but, I, you know, I, I, uh, have we pursued this in a very aggressive fashion? Have you, uh, would you consider, you've been around now a long time, and, um, and this, uh, would you say that we've pursued this aggressively? Let me just tell you why I ask that, is that here we have today several witnesses um, here who've indicated what has happened. We have people out there that wanted to come and testify. We're now getting letters, we're getting phone calls from people that, who are saying that this is the experience that they had. And it seems to be a real problem. I mean, I think that, you know, uh, we all now have to be convinced that there is a problem. Uh, as to the magnitude of the problem, you know, uh, maybe we don't totally know. Maybe we don't. But I think that we are convinced that there is a problem. Now, uh, with that in mind, would you say that you feel that based on what has happened up to this point, that you have aggressively pursued this and to be able to get the kind of information. And I know you, you, you say, well, DOD has a role, and I, I understand that. And uh, eventually, we're going to talk to DOD. And, I mean, there's no question about it. Not, don't think we're not, we're not going to talk to them. But in the meantime, you're here, and we're trying to get as much information as possible. I can only speak for VA on this. I understand uh, that. And I, I'm confident that we have had the full support of Secretary Brown and all of the upper level administration in the VA. They have given us top priority for Persian Gulf programs, for clinical care, for medical research, for compensation programs, and for outreach and education uh, for our veterans. We've received an incredible amount of support um, at all levels within VA. And I think we have a good track record of at least attempting to develop, develop the best programs we can for our Persian Gulf veterans. Uh, we worked very hard on that. We have monitored the quality of those programs and uh, have worked very hard to continuously improve them. I've heard the same comments that you have, both in phone calls to my office and in various uh, congressional <coughs> hearings, that sometimes VA hasn't done the best job at the local level in taking care of veterans. And I've been personally involved in trying to correct those problems when necessary. But I think the vast majority of Persian Gulf veterans who have come into the VA for their health care, the ones who don't show up at hearings, have been ha happy with the health care they've gotten. Um, that certainly was brought out at the Presidential Advisory Committee meeting. They actually went out and talked to veterans at our medical center, and they were pleased with the comments they got back on the satisfaction of those veterans. Well, I'm not going to I'm not going to hold you any longer, but let me just say, and I want to say it very clear, that uh, we're not going to go away. We're going to pursue this issue, regardless of who the chair of this committee is next year. You know, be it my good friend, if he's fortunate enough uh, to be able to hold on, by, you know, and uh, uh, we will continue to pursue it. And God knows, if I am fortunate enough to uh, be the chair of it, uh, that we're going to pursue it. So we're not going to go away. So you might as well start digging and getting the, getting the answers because, and, uh, and I'd like to just convey to DOD, who uh, has representatives here but did not come to testify, that you're not off the hook. We will talk to you. We will talk to you. No question about it. And I want to let DOD know that. So, Mr. Chairman, with that in mind, I want you to know I yield back to you and tell you that I join arms with you, join hands with you in making certain that we get to the bottom of all of this. Yeah, we left out one part. Maybe our replacements will carry on after us. <laughs> no, I explained that before you arrived. I said uh, I got 88 percent the last time, and I'm certain that uh, I might drop down some, but I'll have 51 percent. Well, I would like to work for you if I'm not back. <laughs> um, I would like to uh, just uh, conclude, Ms. Murphy, and then I have one more question for you, Ms. Uh, Dr. Murphy. I'm sorry, Ms. Uh, Ms. Copeland. On your uh, testimony on page um, 7, he said studies of low-level chemical warfare agent exposure were not given high priority in its 1995 working plan because military and intelligence sources had stated that U.S. troops had not been exposed to chemical agents. 
And then later on you say, the VA has always remained open to the possibility that, that the Persian Gulf War veterans were potentially exposed to a wide variety of hazardous agents while serving the Southwest Asia theater of operations, including chemical agents. Prior to the DOD announcement on June 21, 1996, VA designed its clinical uniform case assessment protocol to detect clinical signs and symptoms relating to neurotoxic exposures. I'm a little confused. I, what, what it sounds to me like is that you used the DOD as a basis for you're not listening to your veterans and to all the facts that just were, you know, just looking you square in the face that there was this Gulf War syndrome, which is lots of maladies, that had a toxic feature to it. And tell me, when, when, is, when does your own work override the, 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 the work of the DOD? How, what would our, let me put it this way, what would our veterans have had to do to get the VA to finally begin uh, low-level chemical um, warfare agent exposure tests and, and recognize that there was that possibility? What would they have had to do? From my testimony, I think you'll see that we actually did begin testing. Part of the problem that we have, Mr. Chairman, is that there is no diagnostic test or biomarker. There isn't a blood test that I can do on a veteran that tells me that they were exposed to mustard gas or nerve agent back in the 1991 time period. That's an unfortunate consequence. We don't have good diagnostic tests in that regard. But we did listen to our veterans, and we did start a specialized program at the Birmingham VA that looked at a, a group of veterans who said that they felt that they were exposed. And we looked for the secondary effects, which are neurologic. We did very careful, detailed neuropsychological testing in that group of individuals. We also um, did a comprehensive, comprehensive examination that looked for um, possible uh, secondary effects of chemical agents, including, again, neurologic effects. Some of the things that you would worry about would be cognitive effects. But, but the bottom line is, effects. with all due respect, now that you know they're chemicals for a certainty or, or potential possibility, let me use that term, uh, you're going to do something else. You're going to do something different. What is the new things that you're going to do? We're going to develop a research program that specifically focuses on very low level exposure that we had previously been told didn't exist. Okay. You were told they, no. Well, yes and no. They told you they didn't have any proof of. No, they but, told us it didn't happen. Um, I'd like you to elaborate on that. Told us what didn't happen. That, that chemical weapons were not being used offensively? That there had been no verified detections and that, that, that no veterans had been exposed. That there had been no verified detections. But, but so you listened to DOD and not the veterans. How come? We didn't. No, you did. Take you back. No, no you didn't listen to the veterans. We developed a special program to, that... No, ma'am, no, ma'am. This is... to evaluate those Dr. Veterans. Murphy, the we whole... also... Wait a minute. I'd be happy to wait, but then I want you to, to address that point, so I'll let you continue. We also, from the very beginning, looked at a comprehensive evaluation program for those people with difficult to diagnose conditions that focused on trying to get clinical information that might point us to a specific toxic exposure. Clearly, if the majority of people had come in with documentable neuropsychological problems and peripheral neuropathy, despite what we had been told about no evidence of exposure, we would have gone on and developed a research program focused on that. That isn't what happened with our clinical programs. But and despite that, we went on and designed a survey and were asking 15,000 Persian Gulf veterans if they feel they were exposed the chemical ner agents, nerve agents, mustard gas. When, when have you started to do that? It was uh, begun, you know, last fall in oh, November. Last fall, 1995? It was designed prior to that. Birmingham, the, the clinical pilot program, was begun in 1993 when the veterans voiced their concerns to us. So I think the record shows the VA has listened to veterans. We have done both clinical work and designed research focused on this issue, despite 
the lack of information. It would be foolish for us. Okay, I'm going to want to inject myself here, but if you've made your point, you want to just keep making the point? Go ahead. Okay. You are doing something different today now that you know that our troops might have been exposed. What is the different thing you're doing today? And you have used as an excuse that you weren't doing what you're doing today, you didn't do before because you didn't know and DOD specifically said they weren't exposed. So that's on the record. So what is this new thing you're doing today? We're, we have research programs that are now focusing on low-level chemical agent okay. exposure. So, and when did, those re, uh, when did those research programs begin to focus on low-level chemicals? When did you start that? The research working group made its recommendations immediately after the announcement in June of 1996. So it's fair for me to say that you didn't begin the low level until the DOD finally get, put their stamp of approval on the fact that our soldiers may have been exposed to chemicals. Sir, let me just say something. I, I not, with all due respect, I don't mind you even coming up and testifying. I'd be happy to swear you in. I, I'm not trying to intimidate you, but, but we're, all we're trying to do is know the facts. And it's, I, I don't want to be unfair to, to, to Dr. Murphy. There are so many things in this issue. So if you'd like to identify yourself and be sworn in, I would be happy to, to have you testify. And I'm not saying that to intimidate you not to. Dr. Murphy, would you like him to testify? I would be more than welcome to. Thank you. Okay. I think I can speak. For I don't even mind if you sit there and, and not and not uh, testify if you want to say something. I, I don't mean that in a critical way. I think there are times you need to seek someone else who has information. So I would welcome that if you'd like to sit there. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd just well, like to take yes. back to the, the fact that for me. in 1993, years before we had confirmation, we set up clinical programs to evaluate veterans yes. to see if we could find any evidence of neurotoxic exposures. might expect due to a toxin's effect on the central nervous system were not present in the individuals. Were you here when uh, Nick Roberts uh, gave his testimony, described? Uh, no, I was not. Okay. I'm sorry. I was at the Agent Orange Well, he, he basically um, uh, pointed out that he was in a circumstance where he um, woke up and his testimony said, uh, I was awakened by a loud explosion running to the bunker. I heard a second explosion and noticed a, a large fireball toward the port. Once in my assigned bunker, I put on my gas mask. We sat there for approximately 20 minutes, and then, then the all-clear sign clear was given. We left the bunker and went outside. I estimate that half of the unit returned to their tents, and the other half remained outside talking. To the best of my knowledge, there were 112 men assigned to the air detachment. I was one of the men outside talking. Within just a few minutes, my arms, neck, and face were stinging. My lips felt numb, and I had a strange taste in my mouth, like a copper penny or perhaps a metallic taste better describes it. Some say a mist came over the camp. I do not remember a mist, but more of a fog. Just about the time we all concluded we had been hit with something, chemical alarms began sounding. Alarms were going off everywhere. Marines camped nearby began to yell, go back to your bunkers, we have been gassed. Once inside the bunker, we were ordered to mop level four. Radio transmissions were coming in, confirmed gas attack. I repeat, confirmed gas attack. All stations go to full mob uh, level four. We stayed at Mach 4 about one hour, and then we were given the all clear once again. Afterwards, many of us went to the water tank and washed ourselves down to stop the stinging. My first symptoms were redness of the skin and welts on my chest that afternoon. Now, this is not atypical. I mean, I'm sure you've heard soldiers tell you that. When a soldier tells you that, do you say, well, don't worry, uh, DOD has assured us that no chemicals were used? Is that what you do? No, we try to investigate further. Okay. Well, uh, the CIA didn't investigate further, and you're investigating further, regretfully, resulted, though, in the fact that low-level testing is just beginning now. And so I just say to you with, with a, a great deal of respect that um, no one has been listening to our veterans, including the VA, including the CIA, including the DOD, frankly, including a majority of Congress and all of us who waited too long to get in this issue. I'm going to uh, just end... Uh, Ms. Copeland, with uh, a question about uh, figure three on the document you gave us.
And I'd like to um, have you uh, tell me what assumptions, how, what are the assumptions that were uh, used to determine uh, this chart? This is chart three. That's correct. The assumptions are on page four in the box text, and I can go through those if you'd like. Assumptions are on page four of? The text. Okay, give me one second. Thank you, I'm all set. And what are those? Box text. Okay. And, okay, thank you. I'm all set. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Do you want me to read through? Uh, just give those? me some of them and tell me uh, who made these assumptions. Uh, we made these assumptions we based being the on CIA? we being CIA. That's correct. Okay. And if for the for the um, area involved to have been wider, what assumptions would have had to have been different? I can't answer that at this time, but I can get back to you. Okay. Uh, one, one, I did say one final question, but um, what was the final determination to the CIA that chemicals were used in this site? That, excuse me, chemicals were present in this depot, Camasaya? I'm sorry, I don't understand the what, question. What, what, what finally convinced the CIA that chemicals were used, uh, were in Bunker 73? Convinced us, or what made us made us look at it in the beginning in September 1995. As what convinced you that they were there? The UN inspection team going in in May 96 and identifying in the bunker those characteristics that were that were typical of Iraqi CW munitions. And so and that UN group went in when? May 1996. Okay. And that was um, uh, a that convinced uh, the UN inspectors that um, chemicals had been used. That was the first time they were in that, excuse me, chemicals were present. That's the second time they were there or the first time? They were there several times. I don't know the exact number. Okay. Uh, is there anything either of you would like to say before we get to our next panel? Mm. Okay, thank you very no, much. No, 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 oh, I'm sorry, yeah. my apologies. Yeah, just, my apologies. Thank you very much. Dr. Murphy, you indicated in your testimony, thank you, that a small number of veterans have unexplained illnesses. What's a small number? Let me give you two answers for that. Um, in our registry, our original registry, we hadn't really focused in on the issue of unexplained illnesses. We were at that time thinking in 1991 that we might see a lot of respiratory disease related to oil well fires, diagnosable medical conditions. And so there was no specific question that asked about unexplained or undiagnosed illness on the regist original registry. In order to try to give you an estimate of how many people from that original registry might have unexplained illnesses, we, we did an analysis that looked at veterans who reported they had symptoms, but the physician did not give them a diagnosis. And there are several reasons why that is, is a very crude estimate. And that's about 23% of the first 52,000 people that came in. Since September of, of um, 1996, we have, excuse me, 1995, we redesigned the registry and there's a specific question at the end of the registry examination after the physician has written their sim the symptoms and the diagnosis and it asks the physician to specifically designate whether they feel the patient has an unexplained illness, yes or no. When the physicians are asked that question of the first 800 people that we had computerized data on, only 6% of the physicians said that they felt that their patient had an unexplained illness. So I think that, that uh, with more uh, experience on that new registry, we may have better numbers. But it seems to be a relatively small number. I wouldn't rely on 
after only 800 exams. Mm -hmm. Let me close by just asking, thank you very much, Dr. Murphy. Uh, Ms. Cope, when you testified that the Iraqis reported that 300 metric tons of chemical munitions were destroyed, can we establish that we destroyed that amount? And what does your intelligence tell, tell us? I mean, the 5 percent of the 700, what our intelligence tells us is that there were only two sites that had the chemical munitions in it. The Iraqis, what they did was move the chemical munitions out of sites uh, like the bunkers and other facilities, several of them, and moved them into the open and covered them up. So we agree with the, what the Iraqis have given us, the information, and have no other information to, to disagree with it at this time. Right. I want to ask you a question, uh, and, and uh, if um, you don't want to ask, just say, I do not want to ask it. Please don't say DOD. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, right. Can we get that agreement up front? That's fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, let me ask uh, Ms. Copeland, what are the specifications for the MA chemicals alarm and the FOX detection vehicle? Uh, did these uh, detection devices work? I can't answer that. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I yield back to Jim. <laughs> Dr. Murphy? Could I just sure. make a concluding comment? Sure. I'm going to ask an, a, a, just one more question, so maybe I'd like you to just wait. I, this is more of a housekeeping question. How many cancer cases among veterans are on the Persian Gulf Registry? Um, I, I don't remember that exact number offhand, uh, but I have it in a notebook in the back of the room, so I'll give that to you before I leave. No, I, I want it under uh, oath. So if someone could get that for us. John. You want to make your uh, uh, comment and we can get back to it? I would uh, just like to encourage veterans to take advantage of the VA health care programs. We'd like to see any veteran who's concerned about their health at this, this point, whether they're in the 37th Engineering Battalion or the other units that were around Camasilla um, at the time of the bunker or the pit incident, uh, and any other veteran who is concerned about their health come in for a registry health examination. The VA is there for you, and we'd like you to take advantage of us. For more information, anybody can call 1-800-PGW-VETS. That's Persian Gulf Vets. It's a toll-free helpline, and they'll tell you how to register for the health care programs. Um, this is uh, data that was prepared in uh, January of 96 by the Environmental Epidemiology Service. Of the first 52,216 examinations on Persian Gulf veterans in the health registry, there were two th 202 cancers in males and 24 in females. So that's a total of 226. That is only the data from the registry. It does not include the diagnostic data that we previously provided to you from our inpatient hospitalization records. I would refer you back to the uh, information we provided you on, uh, at the last hearing for those numbers. In, in the subcommittee in June 25th, the director of the Atlantic Region Office of the Veterans Benefit Administration, Gary Hickman, testified that there were about 704 Gulf War veterans with malignant cancers. Can you kind of give us a sense of how that relates to the 226? Some of those are other unique individuals, and some of them are individuals that, who are already included in the 200 plus that I just gave you. The veterans' benefits files are those individuals who have applied for uh, and in some cases received compensation for malignant cancers. Let me, but just the Veterans Benefits Administration has their own data file for administrative purposes, and we have our health files. Right. I, I understand, but they're all people with cancer. And what I'm trying to relate, and they're all, I guess, Gulf War veterans. What I'm trying to understand is why is your number 226 and why is uh, is, is his number 704? You, you had specifically asked, sir, for the number of cancers on our health registry examination. Okay. Okay. And that's the number I gave you. Okay. Why wouldn't there be more if there's 704 um, that Mr. Hickman has? Because it's a voluntary program, and some people choose to get an examination for compensation and don't come in to get a registry examination. Okay, uh, but do you use that? Everyone as a do you practice. use that? 
226 number as, as a number that illustrates how many people have cancers? No, sir. How do you use that? What's the significance of the 226? We, we use the Persian Gulf Registry as a very crude health surveillance tool. Um, we feel that the proper way to get answers to the prevalence of cancers, the rates and frequency of cancer in the Persian Gulf veterans population is through well-designed research programs. When you were in California talking about 226 uh, cancer cases among the 552,260 veterans in the Persian Gulf Registry, do you point out it's just a crude registry and that there are a lot more that have cancer? Yes, and we've pointed that out to your committee before, that that, that in fact is oh, but not... When you were out in California, what, what would you... What, what would... Um, I'm just trying to get a handle on... Uh, um, in California, sir? Uh, excuse me, I, well, I'm missing we, we, the significance we, it of was just, Well, it's just that that's where we're just trying to listen to what the VA says, and, and a, you recently stated in the California meeting, I wish I had the date, that there were 226 cancer cases among the 52,216 veterans on the Persian Gulf Registry. And, and, and that to me is, you know, you're saying to someone that's a significant number. You're quoting me. I'm, I'm, no, I'm not saying a significant <laughs> number. I, I, the fact that you said it says to me that you think it's a meaningful number of some kind. And then we have testimony that says there's 704 Gulf War veterans with malignant cancers. Um, and I'm just trying to sort that out. I just, I just need to know what's the point. Well, if, it's, if this is a crude health surveillance tool, what's the point of it? I mean, if someone hearing you would say, well, there's just 226. I, re I, may, I don't remember the context of that comment sure. that's being attributed to me. I'm not okay. sure that I even said that. Okay. But... Those numbers are correct from what I've just told you. I responded directly to your question about how many veterans on the health registry oh, you had did. cancers. Uh, you and in that context... Uh, in that context, I, I agree. In it that has context, no significance. But I'm just, just trying to understand in that context, what's the significance? And you're telling me it's a crude health care surveillance tool. So... Um, it has no significance, sir. It has no significance? None. Is that uh, how you want to end? The registry was set up to provide health care. And in providing that health care, we do some monitoring to assure that the, the examinations are being done completely and to try to get some basic health information about the veterans who are coming into VA to see us. We recognize that that is not a complete assessment of the health of Persian Gulf veterans. and. We're really just trying to get additional information from the health care programs that we provide. We have said repeatedly in testimony, in meetings, and every chance we get that we feel that the best way to get answers about the health status of Persian Gulf veterans is through research. And we have that research designed. You should be get, seeing results uh, of several different surveys of Persian Gulf veterans in late 1996. And I would base my conclusions about the health of Persian Gulf veterans not on these self-selected health care programs like the registry or the CCEP, but on good, sound, scientific studies. And that's my message to you. Okay. And, and my message to you is that um, obviously we can't depend on the Department of Defense or the CIA uh, to encourage you to do the studies you need to do so that when you get veterans who are coming to you with serious physical problems that you begin the studies and not wait for them. Uh, with that, um, we'll just call on our next panel. Thank you both very much. Our next panel is one person, uh, James Tewitt, International Security Consultant and Director, Gulf War Research Foundation, who also, I believe, worked with Mr. Regal. Yes, sir. Uh, as Mr. Regal uh, was one of the first to uh, get into this entire issue. Yes, ma'am. And you were his staff person on that? I directed the investigation for the yeah. committee, sir. Well, I'm eager to hear from you. Uh, let, me t uh, let me swear you in. And uh, I hope people from the CIA and uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs will stay and hear your testimony. If you'd raise your right hand. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth.
I do. Thank you very much. What's it like to be on the other side of the table? It's fine. Good. Mr. Chairman. Yes. A letter I received from a sick Gulf War veteran during the Senate Banking Committee investigation into this issue during the 103rd Congress I'm illustrates... I'm going to interrupt you, Mr. Stewart. I just want to just get a sense of your involvement with this issue, even if you're going to start to do it in your testimony. Yes, sir. When, when did you work for Mr. Mr. Regal was chairman of the government banking? So he was actually the chairman of the Senate Banking Committee investigation, and we were looking into both the U.S. exports to Iraq that may have contributed to their chemical and biological warfare programs, as well as the possible health consequences of the war after we received a number of reports that the soldiers may actually be ex sick from exposure to those compounds. And you were there from when to when? I was there from 1993 to 1995. So from 1993 when? Beginning end? To uh, around June of 1993. 1993 to? Till the end of the 103rd Congress. Right. And um, you um, were involved in how many hearings on this issue? Only one hearing. I wrote three reports for the Senate Banking Committee on this issue and interviewed several thousand veterans regarding their experiences in the Gulf War. So it w while there was only one hearing, there was extensive interviews during, that, during the course of those two years plus? That's okay. correct, sir. We handled it more as uh, uh, an in outs outside of the hearing room style of investigation uh, where, we, where we were actually interviewing literally thousands of veterans. Well, um, thank you for that information and please proceed. Sorry I interrupted you. Mr. Chairman, a letter received from a sick Gulf War veteran during the Senate Banking Committee investigation into this issue during the 103rd Congress illustrates the way this, information, this investigation has been handled by the government. He wrote, we had gas alarms go off several times. We were told they were all false alarms. We noticed what we thought were missiles streaking across the sky. We were told these were shooting stars. We heard loud explosions in the sky and saw bright flashes of light. We were told these were sonic booms. That veteran is now suffering from Gulf War syndrome. Mr. Chairman, the Senate Banking Committee received similar deceptive answers from administrative officials and Department of Defense and Central Intelligence Agency bureaucrats when it asked que similar questions regarding this issue. It has been the position of the Department of Defense since mid-1993 that no chemical agents were detected and that no chemical munitions were forward deployed in areas occupied by U.S. forces. The facts continue to argue otherwise. During the Banking Committee investigation, we received thousands of calls and documents from servicemen and women, many claiming that chemicals were detected and that munitions were in areas where U.S. forces were deployed. On June 21, 1996, the Department of Defense finally admitted that chemical weapons were in the Kuwaiti theater of operations and that they were improperly destroyed by U.S. troops after the war. But even with this admission, they insisted only a small number of troops were exposed. In February oh, 19... Me, sir, I missed. What was, what was destroyed? Chemical munitions, sir. Okay. In February 1994, I composed letters to the Secretary of Defense, Health and Human Services, and Veterans Affairs on behalf of Chairman Regal, requesting that all information regarding this issue be declassified for the benefit of medical researchers and the veterans. In May 1994, we received a joint response from all three cabinet secretaries asserting that there was no information classified or otherwise responsive to our request. In March 1994, Chairman Regal sent a letter to the Secretary of Defense requesting transmittal of all classified and unclassified information regarding this issue directly to the Office of the United States Senate Security. The requested information was never received. We did, however, receive a response in April 1994 from the Defense Department's General Counsel's Office telling us that CENTCOM, the command element uh, during the Persian Gulf War, could not locate anything described as a log regarding chemical and biological warfare activity. Many of the documents denied to Congress, including elements of the CENTCOM nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare log, were subsequently partially declassified and released to individuals and even put on the Internet. Yes, those responsible for protecting our soldiers would rather give information, some of which I believe gratuitously identified both vulnerabilities and intelligence methods to, and sources to international curiosity seekers before they would give it to Congress. The report that I am submitting to the Committee for Inclusion into the record as part of my testimony draws on some of these very documents, the existence of which were previously denied. It also draws upon assessments of the U.S. Army National Ground Intelligence Center and the findings of the Persian Gulf investigative team, acknowledging that the detections of the Czechoslovak chemical defense specialists were reliable, credible, and based on wet chemistry analysis. The method does not disclose the amount of agent to which the troops were exposed to, but it does reliably identify the specific substances. 
During the Gulf War, substances identified during the first week of the air war were sarin, cabin, and mustard agent. Up to now, the missing element in the equation has been the mystery of how the agents were transported from the research, productions, and storage facilities in Iraq to the troops. This has been an especially difficult issue since it has been the long-held assertion of the Department of Defense, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and the Central Intelligence Agency that the winds were blowing in the wrong direction during the detection events. The report I submit today solves this mystery for the detections that occurred after the initial wave of uh, coalition bombings of these chemical warfare agent storage facilities during the first two days of the air war, using visible and infrared meteorological satellite imagery from NOAA, which was available to military planners during the war, a war before which they expressed deep concern about the fallout from these bombings, I've been able to determine that a thermal plume rose into the atmosphere over the largest Iraqi chemical warfare agent research production and storage facility at Mathana after the coalition and aircraft, aircraft and missile bombardment. 17 metric tons of sarin were reportedly destroyed during these attacks which began on January 17, 1991. These thermal and visual plumes extend directly towards areas where those same chemical warfare agents were confirmed by Czechoslovak chemical specialists. These images are displayed both in the chart here in the hearing room, which I will put up after my testimony, uh, and in the report I am submitting with my testimony. Mr. Chairman, hundreds of thousands of U.S. servicemen and women were in the area where these detections occurred, assembling for the upcoming invasion of, uh, of Iraq and the liberation of Kuwait. There has been a, an assertion by Dr. Stephen Joseph, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs and others, that there was no acute phase to Gulf War syndrome, and therefore it could not be as a result of exposure to chemical agents. Yet the majority of the thousands of veterans who contacted the Banking Committee during its investigation reported that they experienced undiagnosed flu-like illnesses and rashes during the war. Mr. Chairman, the Environmental Protection Agency provides warning pamphlets through the U.S. Department of Agriculture to farm workers using pesticides, many of which are organophosphate relatives of the nerve agents, but thousands of times less powerful. These pamphlets warn that if flu-like symptoms and rashes occur after exposure to these compounds, medical assistance should be sought immediately. Exposure to these compounds has also been linked to chronic illnesses and neurological and musculoskeletal illnesses similar to those being reported by the soldiers. A recently published peer-reviewed study by Dr. Grand Jamal of British veterans revealed that 14 of 14 randomly selected veterans all showed signs of peripheral neuropathies similar to those seen in, victim, seen in victims of chronic organophosphate exposure. In earlier testimony before this committee, the finding of a small-scale molecular epidemiology study conducted by Dr. Howard Ernovitz, myself, and scientists from the University of Arkansas and two Veterans Affairs facilities disclosed that two geographically separate groups of Gulf War veterans were not expressing antibodies to type 2 and type 3 polio, a vaccine that we all receive. This immunological anomaly was not observed in the non-veteran control study. This research continues with the goal of identifying the course and progress of the illness. This type of research, in turn, is an essential first step in the ultimate goal of treating the veterans of the war. The reporting I'm submitting with my testimony today does not establish the link between low-level organophosphate chemical nerve agent exposure and Gulf War syndrome. It does, however, scientifically overturn the long-held government position that the troops were not exposed to chemical warfare agents in, as was said by Central Intelligence Agency Director Deutsch, any widespread way. While some clinical studies have been done suggesting such a link, the exact processes responsible have not been identified. The same, however, has been said of the connection between cigarette smoking and lung cancer and the exposures of veterans uh, to Agent Orange and the horrible illnesses that they are suffering. The link, it se seems clear, however, even though the precise method the causative, that the causative agents creates the illness is not fully understood. Research and proper neurological, immunological, and microbiological testing of Gulf War veterans are needed to determine the cause, course, and potential treatment for this illness. Further, this approach will assist in resolving which aspects of the illness may be causing spousal and familial transmission and the possible links between the reported exposures and birth defects. The delayed response of the medical community to Persian Gulf War-related illnesses as a result of government mismanagement of this issue may mean that the illness has progressed in these veterans and their family members. Mr. Chairman, I am concerned that if we expend our efforts trying to discover and punish those responsible for miscalculations and cover-up, both of which I believe have occurred, we are distracted from what must be our first priorities, determining the cause and treatment of Gulf War syndrome and correcting the chemical and biological warfare defense gap faced by our forces. 
This calls for an independent investigation into the decisions made during the calls for an independent investigation into decisions made during and after the war. Well, welcome should not be an excuse for further act delaying acting on these priorities. An independent investigation should not replace the popularly chosen panel envisioned by our founding fathers over 200 years ago to resolve these sorts of problems of the Congress. I would recommend, based on what we know now, that nearly all of our soldiers were in the Gulf were exposed to chemical warfare agents, that Congress move speedily to enact legislation similar to the Agent Orange Act of 1991, mandating assistance to affected veterans, extending the presumptive period indefinitely for veterans with certain medical conditions, and funding independent research into illnesses and the possible effects on veterans' families. Simultaneously, and perhaps more importantly, Congress should initiate an independent review of the entire U.S. chemical and biological defense program, including the military doctrine and analytical and predictive capabilities to warn of chemical and biological threats in both the Department of the Defense and the Central Intelligence Agency. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I thank you for this opportunity to present my testimony and ask that the full text of my remarks and the accompanying material be included in the record. Thank you, Mr. Tewitt. It's very provocative, interesting testimony. I will start with... Um Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and let me begin by first thanking you for your testimony. And let me make certain that I un understood you clearly. Are you saying that nearly all of the United States troops who served in Operation Desert Storm were exposed to chemical agents? That's correct, uh, Representative Towns. What, what happened was that when we hit these facilities, the, we, were, we were bombing these facilities in many cases with F-117s and other cases with Tomahawk cruise missiles. And the missiles would hit the facilities, many of which contained volatile compounds, which would cause secondary fires and thermal, what I, what I would call a thermal event. Now, the bombings, for the most part, occurred at night when the air was relatively cool. And as we all know, hot air rises, as does pollution that's contained in hot air. And the materials were lifted to higher altitudes, and both the infrared imagery and the upper atmospheric weather patterns confirm that during the period from the bombings to the point that these chemicals were scientifically confirmed by the checks, they were coming directly towards the troops. So we have a release of chemicals at point A. We have a, a footprint, if you will, going from point A to where the troops are. And then we have the detections at that point distance in an area where hundreds of thousands of troops were assembling for the invasion of Iraq. We're talking about like 700, almost 700,000 troops, right? In that particular area, it was only several hundred thousand. Some of the troops were in further distant areas that, um, in, in the rear. But in the King Khalid military city area, Hafer al Batin area, and in the northern part of the theater, uh, we had all of the divisions assembling for the upcoming invasion. So the troops were continually moving up into that area. You know, this is a big number, right? If you're talking about... Um it's possible that it's transmittable. If that's the case, I mean, we're talking about a lot of people. In, in terms of transmissibility, I think that what we may be looking at in the transmissibility area is opportunistic infections as a result of some of the exposures, not, not necessarily a biological pathogen. And some of the evidence of that is, is that we had cross-species die-offs in, in, the, in the theater. It's also an evidence of a chemical exposure. We had animals, large, large mammals. We had insects. We had birds dying simultaneously as reported by the soldiers in the theater. And that's not consistent with a biological pathogen. That's consistent with a toxicological exposure. Sheeps don't pass the disease to flies, don't pass the disease to, to, to insects, and so on. Mm -hmm. Right. Let me just uh, ask you, because I know that you had a lot of experience. You worked here in, uh, uh, for a number of years. And um, you mentioned independent investigation. How would that? Uh, group be put together? Uh, truly, we need an investigation, whether it be conducted by the GAO or a, a, a group that's assembled by, you know, through a cooperative effort of both Congress and the administration, as some prior independent panels have been created with the speakers and the, uh, the ranking members creating such a panel um, and, and selecting members of the panel. But they need to have investigators whether they're detailed from the FBI or some of the federal law enforcement agencies with subpoena power, the ability to be able to walk in and demand records uh, from the VA, the Department of Defense, and the uh, Central Intelligence Agency, 
and do that kind of, of an analysis. Now, this wouldn't necessarily all be information for public consumption, obviously. But the, we, we need to have some kind of review because it is obvious that our chemical and biological warfare defense doctrine during the war, which did not acknowledge the fact that you know cumulative effects of low-level nerve agent exposure can cause not just chronic illnesses, but if the war had been a six-month or a 12-month war and these exposures would have continued, they could have caused very, very serious illnesses to the soldiers and affected uh, the military mission. Um, so what we need to be able to do is look at the doctrine very independently to determine what the medical threat is to our soldiers, what the medical threat is in a, in a four-day war, the medical threat from the bombings, the medical threat from uh, both acute and low-level exposures to try and develop a defense, a defensive doctrine that will protect our soldiers not only for the three or four days or the three or four months that we need them for their military mission, but provide the necessary safety precautions that they can protect our soldiers from having long-term health problems even after they're discharged from military service. All right. Thank you very much, uh, yeah. Mr. Tewitt. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Mr. Tewitt, did you have um, uh, clearance to, to get information that wouldn't be available to the general public? I had top secret SCI clearances during the investigation. Um, so if I ask you a particular question, um, you're able to, to, to remember what, what is you can tell me and what you can't tell me? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> kind of a dumb question, I guess. But <laughs> the, um, Do we have the ability to detect, because I haven't gotten a briefing on this, uh, the ability to detect biological agents with equipment? We have a very primitive system called the BID system, um, Biological in Integrated Detection System, which uses certain, can, can identify a limited number of agents if they know what those agents are ahead of time. Um, in a 1994 counterproliferation initiative conference, um, again, Deputy then Deputy Secretary Deutsch from the Department of Defense, uh, said at that conference, we currently have no biological agent detection capability deployed with any of our forces anywhere in the world. And uh, that was a videotaped comment. Um, but we do have, that, that was an inaccurate comment, we do have a primitive system, but it takes some number of hours or days to get any kind of a response from that system. So if there was a biological threat in the area by the time we received a warning, the soldiers would all be infected. Um. There is a constituent of the state of Connecticut, not the 4th Congressional District, whose son was a pilot in uh, Persian Gulf mm -hmm. Theater and um, became very sick. And he was diagnosed to have a whole host of different mm -hmm. problems, nothing related to chemicals. Right. His parents have spent $20,000 to have him examined and treated in Texas. And they say that um, uh, from a layman's term, he gets rashes, he gets, um, he, he, the, 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 he is being treated to try to get the chemicals out of his system. He'll have, go into a steam room and people will literally leave the steam room because the smell in the steam room is so toxic, mm -hmm. so, so um, uh, unbearable for anyone else there. I mean, you know, you hear things like that and, and uh, you don't know in my environment, I don't know how to... <coughs> how to, to read that, but the fact is, he's a sick person. And they see physical, not mental, effects of his illness. Not mental, they see physical. Now, what, one of the things that surprised me is that, that I would think that, um, that, that um, the United States that has developed some chemical weapons, like other countries have, and then destroyed some, um, that we would also have tested to get uh, determine the effects of these chemical weapons on uh, various animals and so on, and I would think that we would have the ability to to know if the uh, the effects that I guess what I'm asking you to do is do you have any knowledge in the research that you do uh, that would um, give me feeling that the United States has a better handle on toxic exposure, chemical exposure, and how you treat it? There are two different standards in terms of military and civilian standards is what, consider, what they consider to be toxic exposures. Uh, the civilian standards are much more stringent than the military standards. I'm more interested in treatment. In terms of treatment, uh, most... And I'm interested in, not just in terms of treatment, but in terms of uh, kind of the symptoms. 
I mean, I, I mean, I, I listen to this. I think I'm a normal human being, mm -hmm. and and people describe things that say, "Hey, you're really sick," and and then we have someone who will come and testify that they've been uh, felt to have these various symptoms, and they put names next to those symptoms, and and yet somehow, um, and they seem they seem very logical to be connected to some kind of chemical exposure. Right. And yet, it's like when we have the government officials come before us, like somehow, well, it hasn't been proven, it hasn't been shown. We need the DOD to tell us that there was exposure before we react to the symptoms and assume that they are caused by chemical uh, exposure. In terms of medical treatment, I, I am not aware of any of the veterans who have received medical treatment from any of the, the groups who have had long-term and permanent um, cures. Uh, some of the veterans who were treated with antibiotics in the very early stages and when they came back claim that their health is much better, others do not. Um, when you have a neurotoxicological exposure like this, uh, you have damage to your body's ability to be able to mount an immune response to the things that you and I come into contact with every day. And that makes it very difficult to treat because we can treat what's wrong with them today, but it makes it very difficult to deal with what the injury is that's underlying the illness that they have. So when you have an, an illness provoked by an injury, in other words, if, if I, and, and a good example to, of this would be AIDS, where you have people who have AIDS have a, a viral insult, but that viral insult is causing their immune system not to respond. So the people who die from AIDS die from all sorts of opportunistic infections and cancers, not from HIV. And likewise, when you have any other kind of immune system induced illness, the deterioration of the individual seems to be more related to the inability of the immune system to deal with the things that you and I can deal with in a normal way, uh, causing their condition to deteriorate. Now, some of these things may be identifiable, but many of the, the research, research, researchers that are out there um, are, are, are doing treatment that has short-term results. Now, short-term results are certainly welcome, but if you discontinue the treatment over time, the illness tends to come back. And a lot of, also a lot of neurological healing would depend on the age of the person who is uh, affected. Uh, certainly a 25-year-old should have the ability, if, if his immune system is, is strengthened, to be able to deal with this kind of an issue rather than a 45-year-old, for example, someone my age. In saying that the, um, uh, that the bombing of the bunkers in Iraq um, and the plumes did not reach the U.S. forces, where did the CIA get it wrong and why? May I put a chart up sure. on that? If you can kind of bring that microphone a little closer to you, we might be able to pick it up. The CIA got it wrong by using a model for a retrospective study rather than for a prospective study. Models are designed to determine what might happen if certain conditions to exist, not what exists in the past. Um, models are designed to predict, not to say what happened historically. Models are created from analysis of the historical data. Um, what I did, and I've had a document on the Gulf War weather since the Senate Bank, since the early phases of the Senate Banking Committee investigation. But when we found out exactly when the facility at Mathana was hit, I looked at that document and there was a tremendous gap in that document. The, they showed imagery of the weather on the early hours of the 18th and then they didn't show it again until the late hours of the 19th. So there was almost a 48 hour gap in that document. So I, over a long period of time, uh, I, I acquired a, a, the industry standard program for imagery analysis in this issue and acquired the actual data from NOAA so that the imagery could be, could be analyzed. And when looking at two satellite passes of NOAA 11, one taken before the checks detected chemical agents on the 19th and one taken afterwards, we find a tremendous thermal point event generating above the Mathana facility. Can you point that out? Y yes, sir. 
Fauna facility is located right here. That's and right. We can this photo right here. Okay. It's right beside the upper lake uh, on the map there. And it, what does that tell me, though? That tells me that there's being a, a tremendous amount of heat being generated by something under that particular point. Okay. The heat was being generated by Tomahawk missiles and F-117s using high explosive weapons against very volatile, volatile and combustible materials. Those materials, when hit with these high explosive weapons, would be, in some cases, blown around. In other cases, there would be fires. But the material would be thrust, and the pollution from those materials would be thrust upward. Okay, now, which way does this, do the pictures tell us they went? The pictures tell, tell us they went from the area where the lake is, if, if you can see it there, which yeah. is the light image. This is a reverse image that you're looking at here on the side. Okay from the light area of the lake, directly down into a cloud bank, which was over the area where US forces were located. Now, that is also the area where checks began detecting chemical agents. So, and underneath that plume, we also have a number of other suspected Iraqi chemical warfare agent facilities, including the three facilities at Fallujah, or Habaniya, which is one of the largest chemical production complexes in the world. It, had, it, it produced both chemical agent precursors and other industrial pesticides and compounds of that nature. It, it's, your testimony is then that this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of Kamasaya, that we um, eventually are going to probably hear from the DOD that uh, uh, some of the chemical plants they blew up, uh, that potentially the, um, the fallout was over our troops, not away from our troops? I don't know how they can uh, evade accepting the fact that when these fa the facilities were destroyed and the checks detected the chemicals at a distant point using a, using a method that they consider to be scientifically valid and the plume going directly from point A to point B, how they can deny that there is a high degree of probability not only that it came from this facility but also that at this point we have to admit that hundreds of thousands of U.S. forces were ex exposed. This is only one day. I've only been able to analyze one day. I plan on analyzing the entire war. Now, let me understand, method. is this a long process to be able to analyze each day? I mean, does, do, you, are, do you have the same data that could be available to, uh, do you have the same data available to the CIA or the uh, Defense Department? This data is from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. That's what they would use? That's what they would use. Okay. I've also asked uh, a, a local satellite contractor to take, a, a meteorological satellite contractor to take a look at this to make sure that I'm not saying something that's out of school uh, on this issue. And they've confirmed that there is a, an intense thermal point source of, of thermal activity coming off the area over Mathana well, and coming down towards part, our troops. That part I, is, is I understand. How do they then determine from the picture that it was over our troops? You can geolocate using some of the other, uh, the other identifiable landmarks on the map. And in fact, if you look at the tip of the Sinai Peninsula there, which is over on, in, if you go back to the center. You can, t you can touch the photo. Thank you. you don't have to bring that with you. Okay. Right. We, we know what the geocoordinates of that are and what they are relative to KKMC and Hafer al -Baten. And so we can, we can make very, very clear and concise judgments about exactly where everything is. We know where the Mathana facility is and the other facilities are based on some of the declassified documents that DOD has put out on the Internet. Do you have anybody from the CIA or the DOD that comes to you and says, you know, what do you know and how are you analyzing it and has a, have a dialogue with you or are you totally ignored? Not from the Central Intelligence Agency. I do have an ongoing correspondence with the Department of Defense and the Persian Gulf investigative team. And, and what is their response to what you tell us? Uh, their response is, is that they're continuing to investigate it. <laughs> I, I really don't know how to deal with their position because in addition to the, um, if you look on the far left, the the I have to know which of those okay. four you want me to look at. I'm sorry. In this particular case, we're looking at the upper atmospheric wind patterns coming directly down towards the troops. In every case, for the 48 hours prior to the detection, the wind patterns, the current patterns, were coming down towards the troops. Now, the surface winds vary depending on where you are on Earth because of, of the frictional effect between the upper atmosphere and, and the Earth. So if you're in between two buildings, you might see the wind going one way. And if you're out in a, in a wider street, you'll see it going another way. 
But if you go above that surface layer, you will see the patterns are identifiable. Again, the weather charts are available from NOAA. They, they, they log all of the weather patterns and the pressure gradients everywhere in the world every day, and they have since the 60s. Uh, in, in this case, this satellite passed over the area twice a day. So when looking at the modeling that was done by Science Applications International Corporation, whether we get in debate of whose data they used and whether they have new data now, they simply could now look historically and know exactly what happened? That's correct. The model's not necessary. We have uh, retrospective data that we can analyze. You don't have to look at the model to see if the model was correct. You just look at what actually happened. No, and in fact, if the model was... No, I, you said no or yes. I'm, I don't know how you no, mean No, you do not have to look at the model. In fact, if the model said that it was going anyway, anywhere other than what the wind charts and the satellites say it was going, then the model is inaccurate. Yeah. Okay, now what they say in uh, Figure 6, the CIA was saying that it... That, that it went in the direction, it just didn't go as far. And I'm referring to, to, uh, to figure six on this chart here. Why don't you come here and then That's take actually it. the Mohammediyat facility, which according to uh, the CIA wasn't first attacked until after uh, this particular period. Uh, the Samara facility, or the Mathana facility, was attacked beginning on the 17th. And in their, their analysis, they say it was going from here directly towards right. Baghdad. Right. The plume says that's not true, and in fact, it was the initial plume, or the, the, the intense thermal plume, is going this way. This blows my mind. I mean, I, unless I'm just an idiot here, and you're, you're a fraud. <laughs> I know one of those is... Well, the other thing. issue about their assumption is their assumption is that the, the material would not get more than 15 meters off the ground. I mean, these are images taken from space. Uh, you know, this would be a dialogue that's going to continue, but we need to continue it quickly. Uh, if you'd sit down, unless you make, have any other reference, to, uh, describe to me, tell me what you think is going to happen in the next two or three years. We, we, we finally have, since uh, this year, we finally have acknowledgement that in Kamasaya we, we had uh, potential exposure to our troops. We have our troops saying that uh, you had a burn-off that went 12 miles out. Uh, we now have last, and that, the first announcement was made just before our third hearing. And now, before our fourth hearing, we have a, um, a testimony that, uh, uh, excuse me, not testimony, we have disclosure since last night that 5,000 other people might have been exposed because of the pits. Um, w what do you think is going to happen, what do you think the DOD is going to be forced to acknowledge in the, in the next two to three years? I think ultimately they're going to have to admit the possibility of low-level exposure to everyone in theater. Um, now, what, again, the research is going to have to begin to look at the links between the low-level exposures, some of the mechanisms um, that causes the kinds of illnesses that we're seeing, and possible treatment protocols so that we can actually look at how to, to take care of these soldiers. More, more importantly, I would hope that Congress would start to take action because of the evidence to if you will at this point disregard DOD because after two years of listening to, or three years of listening to deception, uh, misinformation, carefully worded statements on widespread intentional use rather than widespread intentional exposure, that we realize that there is something that they're hiding because of the carefully way they're wording their statements and what we really need to do I believe now is just get on with the business of helping the veterans and get on with the business of making sure that this doesn't happen to our soldiers again. And I, th I think that's going to be a very, very heavy responsibility for those that are involved in the process. That was a wonderful segue into our next panel, which will discuss low-level exposure. And as someone who was in public life in a state house involved in a lot of environmental law, we got into this whole issue of, of low-level exposure to chemicals and how you use them. and under controlled sub, uh, situations and and it's almost like there's a gigantic disconnect between um, between the army and uh, the federal government uh, between EPA and DEP in my own state and their way of looking at it and the way the army and the CIA and others look at it and even the Department of Veterans Affairs the problem with low level exposure is that people get sick slowly but ultimately their symptoms become acute that's correct and um, I well remember uh, I had a group of doctors who came to me and pointed out that when we gave cigarettes to our 
our troops in World War II, 20 years later, the cancer, throat cancer went up like this. They showed this line. And then 20 years later, it went, you know, just almost vertical. And then they did after World War II, and 20 years later, it was a line, and it just went vertical in terms of the number of cancer cases uh, as a, res a result of um, smoking. So um, we can't waste any time here, can we? May, may I add one additional thing? Sure, may. Thing? Uh, in, in regard to the facility at Kamasia, I have in my hand a special battle damage assessment study on Iraqi military support production and storage uh, capability, which was prepared on 3 February 1991. And I quote, also in Iraq, 37 ammunition storage buildings were destroyed at Tal Alam Ammunition Depot, which is the other name for Kamasia. And I've got the documents that also confirm that here. The most extensive hit ammunition storage structures thus far. The attack on Tal Alam resulted in a loss of approximately 10,000 tons of ammunition. So this facility was heavily targeted by coalition forces and may have been the result, may have resulted in fallout in addition to those that occurred during the destruction event uh, far before the 37th Engineer Battalion ever arrived there. And I'll, and I'll give this to the staff uh, for inclusion as well. I thank you uh, for your information and your testimony before the committee. We're just almost getting inundated with what I think are very important, significant reports and studies and so on. You have been a wonderful witness. I thank you very much for being here. Thank you, here. Mr. Chairman. Uh, our fourth panelist, William um, Bomsweiger, I'm probably not doing judge justice to the name, Stephanie Padilla, and Dr. Uh, Claudia Miller. And if Bombs, Bom, Bom Swiger, Padilla, doctor. Doctor. Okay, you know what? We're going to start over again. You're going to teach me how to say your names, but not quiz me afterwards to see if I got it right. You'd remain standing. I'm very sorry. In third grade, my teacher had me read books instead of learn double vowels. You'd raise your right hand. Thank you. Are you all set? You raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Mr. Tewitt, I'm going to invite you to sit down if you don't have to run away and just sit over there. And if you want to respond uh, to anything you've heard, I, uh, that might be helpful. But uh, we have three primary witnesses. I'm going to ask each of you to uh, say your names as I should have said them and uh, give us a little of your background. And then we'll just start this way here. Doctor? Bye. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Dr. William Baumsweiger. My background is neurology and psychiatry. I um, practiced psychiatry for a number of years in Los Angeles and then did a neurology residency at the West LA VA where I uh, started seeing Gulf War patients. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hey, Miller? My name is Claudia Miller. I'm a physician on staff at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. I'm assistant professor there. Uh, my background was originally in environmental health for about 12 years as an industrial hygienist, and then uh, I've become a physician and uh, I'm boarded in internal medicine and in allergy and immunology. My research interest is uh, low-level chemical exposures. I'm Stephanie Padilla, yeah. like tortilla, and I work at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. My training is in biochemistry. I have a Ph.D. in biochemistry, specifically neurochemistry. And I study the effects of pesticides on experimental animals. You all have been here all day long, and, and uh, we didn't quite expect the hearing to go as long. But uh, I, uh, were you here for most of the hearing, all three of you? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to invite you to, to give your testimony. I'm also going to invite you to comment on what you've heard, um, maybe some of the questions that were asked that you think are the questions we need to focus in on. So. Um, and, and uh, if you think that we're just uh, not being experts in this issue, if you um, think that, that any of us up here, even though they can't hear what you're going to say, but I'm still here, uh, that we're off base on something, I want you to correct it. And uh, I want the record to be accurate. So we're in an area that we uh, frankly know a little about, except we can see and hear like anyone else. Um, doctor, why don't we start with you? Thank you very much. Um, first thing I'd like to do, uh, just to clear up this issue of whether or not 
uh, exposure to organophosphates can cause chronic problems, both neurological and immune, is to uh, show you some uh, literature. You got uh, me scared here, Doctor. Yeah, this is only a small fragment of the literature which I got just by going to the UCLA Biomedical Library. All of these books and articles speak to the existence of uh, organophosphate-induced delayed neurotoxicity. Uh, this is a syndrome which has been known <clears throat> since uh, the late 19 1800s, was very clearly documented uh, by 1930, and uh, of which has been a number of uh, accidental exposures, uh, tragedies in the 30s, 70s, 80s. I'm sure that uh, the other witnesses are familiar with these as well. Uh, the signs and symptoms of uh, acute neurotoxicity uh, don't have to be uh, so dramatic as uh, seizures and death. They can be very mild. And they can consist of uh, headaches, nausea, vomiting, episodes of psychosis, personality change. Uh, many of the things that uh, Major Denise Nichols spoke to. And I uh, really recommend that you uh, consider her testimony uh, as to what she saw, the behavioral aberrations and whatnot, as uh, evidence that there was acute low-level exposure. Um, nonetheless, uh, whether or not people did show any acute signs, there is clear evidence that at some point, whether it's weeks or months later, uh, maybe even up to years later, um, people can begin to, to develop uh, chronic central and peripheral neuropathic problems in addition it seems that uh, organophosphates, as well as chemicals like dioxin, are capable of allowing viruses into the lymphocytes of our own cells, viruses which are ordinarily excluded. <clears throat> There's an um, article by Nanda in the Indian Journal of Experimental Biology about this, and uh, came out last year. And we may be seeing not only a neurological problem, but an immune problem as well. Uh, if this is the case, this would explain some of our findings. Uh, I was asked to see in the middle of 1993, late 1993, I was asked to see these patients with the Gulf War diseases because I was at West LA and uh, you know this was supposedly one of the referral centers for Gulf War uh, evaluation. Uh, I have to tell you that I, I don't really know if they understood what was going on because on they one hand, mean who? The, the VA, in, within their own organization because on one, well, it was a very confusing situation. I was a house officer there in neurology and I was told we're supposed to evaluate and treat and take care of these patients. On the other hand, um, when I saw what was, to me, clear signs and symptoms in history suggested that they had been exposed to neurotoxin, I was told that they were not exposed to neurotoxin, that it was, uh, it just simply did not happen and I should not consider that as a possibility and I should treat them for whatever one could conventionally treat them for. That is what I was told. Uh, I didn't go along with this. You were told by the VA? That yes, I was told it was their policy, there was no such thing as uh, exposure to neurotoxin in um, veterans. Okay. This was at the West LA VA. I was told this in no uncertain terms. And this is a, supposedly a treatment center. Now, I have to tell you that there's another side to this. That is, they did let me pursue my own conviction that there was low-level exposure. And they did allow me, rather than kicking me out, which they could very well have done. All right? They did allow me to follow 10 patients who I followed and who I did a thorough study on. 
uh, you have the results of that study. So there was an ambivalence there. And two days before I left, I presented my results to West LA. On the basis of what I did, they proposed twice to the central VA office or wherever uh, an expanded study based on the idea that there had been uh, certain physiological, neurological, neuropsychiatric, neurobehavioral changes that I had found and to pursue looking for more patients, more data that would support what I had found. So on one hand, they were not really happy with me. But on the other hand, they picked up the idea and they tried to run with the ball. I, I just would like you to describe very briefly your findings with those 10 patients. Well, the first thing I noticed was uh, that these patients looked similar to several patients I had seen who had been intoxicated with a chemical uh, used in industry called triethyl, um, uh, trichloroethylene, which is a, a solvent and used in the um, electronics industry. I had seen several patients who had been intoxicated with this and over the course of me by treating them as a psychiatrist it became clear that it was this intoxication which had caused their problems. In one of these books it does mention trichloroethylene as a neurotoxicant and it is well known uh, that it is. They're much more careful with it now than they were back in the 70s and 80s. When these Gulf War gentlemen and ladies came in, uh, my sense was because I was trained in psychiatry, that their psychiatric symptoms really were not psychiatric, but were more like an intoxication. I then looked at their blood pressure, their heart rate, and their temperature very carefully, and I found that they had very unstable heart rate if you stand them up and lie them down and really take a careful heart rate. Very unstable blood pressure if you, again, take it lying down, take it standing up. If you followed their body temperature, their body temperature was either too low or too high for about a week, and then for the next week it would spike up and down. And, you know, these are clear signs that the lower parts of the brain, the brain stem, uh, are dysregulated. And as a matter of fact, I have here, and I'd like to show you some uh, corollary information, which was done, uh, which was done at the West LAVA by myself and my colleagues, which demonstrated uh, that uh, there was instability in the autonomic nervous system. Uh, this uh, page is from a document which demonstrated that they had abnormal responses to warming of the skin, that the blood vessels in the skin would open up too quickly, and that this suggested there was autonomic nervous system instability. And I'll be happy to share that with you. Uh, in addition, I did studies on the lymphocytes of these patients. And my study showed that even though it wasn't horribly high, they, they had higher lymphocytes in their blood. In addition, they all had increased lymphocytes in their spinal fluid, which suggested they had a chronic neurological problem. Now, I, took an even closer look at the lymphocytes in the blood, and it demonstrated that they had too many of the aggressor T4 and too few of the suppressor T8 lymphocytes. I'm sure you've heard of T4 lymphocytes. People with AIDS don't have enough of these. Well, as lymphocytes mature, mature they should go from the aggressor to the suppressor type, and if they don't, then you get a spreading immune problem. This is so the bottom line is what? what is the bottom line is they had a neuroimmune disorder uh, that uh, appeared to be seated in the brainstem, gradually spreading throughout their body, causing pseudo-psychiatric uh, symptoms that could be easily mistaken for mental problems, and uh, causing a number of immune disturbances which could lead to musculoskeletal gastrointestinal, and other difficulties, which could be mistaken as isolated diseases. That's what happened, I believe. I believe that the VA... Um, these were with your 10 patients. These are, these are my 10 patients, and the, the, uh, those results are included in what I, uh, I 
submitted to you before. And you can, in addition, have these here. Now, in terms of the, them having psychiatric problems, uh, I, I felt they weren't psychiatric, and I went ahead and had uh, some what are called quantitative EEGs done, which are mathematical analyses Doctor, of the Doctor, let me EEG. just ask you something. You're making me a little nervous because you're not reading from a statement. You've got lots of books and papers. So I want to I yeah. I somehow contain your, your statement. Sure. At any rate, I'm, I don't need to go through all these. I went, I'm just saying I had the evidence that this was not a mental problem. Right. This was neurological okay. if you do certain kinds of tests. And at first, uh, the VA was saying, you know, they weren't exposed to chemical and they still allowed you to do your, your research. So to their credit, they allowed that to happen. That's right. Um, and what has been the result of your work? Well, I've continued to look at um, Gulf War patients. I actually have continued to work with the VA. I'm now doing a fellowship in uh, EMG in Los Angeles. Does it, are you moving in the same direction? Or is, are the, the, the patients you see now uh, consistent with what the 10 that you saw originally? Or you Absolutely. I've seen another five or six Gulf War patients. They have exactly the same subtle neurological problems. So do, is it your judgment are... are troops were exposed to chemicals? Absolutely. This is OPIDN, organophosphate-induced delayed neurotoxicity, which is a well-known, very thoroughly documented syndrome. Yeah. What I have sense, and I, when we call on you in just a second, Dr. Miller, I'm getting the sense that, that are we in the outer edges of medical research? In other words, is there a lot of disagreement among the fact that you even have to bring these books here to try to convince me that somehow, well, there are some people who say, makes me begin to think that, that um, I'm into something I wasn't expecting. No, it isn't that we're on the outer edge of medical research. It's that there's a big hole, a big gap in medical research, which was caused by psychiatry and neurology splitting off from one another in 1937 okay. or, or thereabouts. Okay. I'm, I, I'm, it's coming back to me. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Miller? I'm going yeah. to come back to you. Uh, I, I was asked by your committee to address the question whether low level levels of uh, something like an organophosphate, for example, serin, could be responsible for some of the health problems that we're seeing in the Gulf War veterans. And of course, just to remind ourselves, serin, of course, was not the only organophosphate type exposure soldiers may have encountered in the Gulf. Uh, pesticides in this chemical class and protostigmine bromide related carbamate drug were also used. Um, I forgot to mention, I also serve on the VA expert. Could I, could I ask you to just lower the mic a little bit? And I'm going to ask sure. you to speak a little more slowly. Sure. I mean, I, I, do any of you have a, a, a plane to catch or something? Oh, is that why you're speaking <laughs> fast? I would have had you go first, doctor. I'm sorry. Yeah. So what time Thanks. is your plane leaving? Uh, 6.45. Okay. Um, you're going to be okay. It's 4.30 unless Thanks. you're going to Philadelphia to get the plane. No. It's national? I appreciate your consideration. Is it national? Yes. Okay. You'll be all right. Thank you. Um, I forgot to mention at uh, the introductory period that um, I serve on the Persian Gulf expert, if you want to call it expert advisory panel for the VA and have since its inception. Uh, effects of low level chemical exposures have been the focus of my research over the last eight years. I co-authored a report for the New Jersey State Department of Health back in 1989 and a subsequent book, um, ironically it was entitled Chemical Exposures, Low Levels and High Stakes about patients who report developing chronic illnesses and chemical intolerances following low-level exposure to various chemicals, including pesticides, solvents, and combustion products. Some of the sickest individuals that we've studied as a group seem to be those who were exposed to an organophosphate or carbamate pesticide in the same chemical class. In 1995, we published a study of 37 patients who had been exposed to pesticides in this same class. These were civilians who subsequently reported developing multi-system multi symptoms and new onset chemical food and drug intolerances. Eighty percent of these individuals told us they were no longer able to work or could only work part-time because of the severity of their health problems. The most common symptoms reported by these individuals at the time they were exposed were often flu-like. For example, fatigue, concentration difficulties, headaches, shortness of breath, musculoskeletal pain, and gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, the specific data on these 37 patients is included in Table 1. In general, these individuals did not report the classical symptoms of organophosphate poisoning. However, they did report developing new and unusual intolerances for common chemicals such as fragrances, 
traffic exhaust, gasoline, household cleaning products, uh, chlorine in swimming pools that was mentioned here earlier, and other kinds of exposures. In addition, many found they could no longer tolerate alcoholic beverages, various foods, caffeine, and medications they were prescribed, including antidepressants and others. Four years ago, the chief of staff of the Houston VA Medical Center asked me to consult on the first Gulf War veteran admitted to their newly designated regional referral center for Gulf War veterans. And this was because the individual was complaining of in chemical intolerances, and the chief of staff asked me uh, to come in as a consultant, having read about some of our work. Since then, I have been asked to evaluate about 75 Gulf veterans. These veteran symptoms and their frequent reports of new onset intolerances to chemicals, foods, and medications reminded me of the civilians we had studied with histories of exposure to organophosphate or carbamate pesticides or to mixtures of solvents at low levels. Comparison of eight symptom scales derived by factor analysis reveals similar ordering of symptoms in the Gulf veterans and the pesticide exposed civilians. Uh, this is included in figure one where you can see the comparison of the different symptom groups. All of the civilians reported new chemical intolerances because they were selected for our study on this basis. However, 78% of the first 59 Gulf veterans we saw at the Houston Center also reported new onset chemical intolerances since the war. For example, mechanics who once liked the smell of engine exhaust or said they used to bathe, literally bathe in solvents with no associated symptoms, reported severe symptoms with these exposures since the war. One mechanic told me that before the war, his idea of the perfect perfume was WD-40. <laughs> now WD-40 and many other low-level chemical exposures, he says, make him feel ill. 78% of the veterans also reported new food intolerances or feeling ill after meals. 40% had experienced one or more adverse reactions to medications since the war. 66% of those who used alcoholic beverages reported that even a small amount, such as one can of beer, made them feel ill. And this was in individuals who frequently enjoyed drinking maybe a six-pack on a weekend. 25% of those who used caffeine reported feeling ill if they drank coffee or another caffeinated beverage. And 74% of those who smoked reported that smoking an extra cigarette or borrowing someone else's stronger brand made them feel ill. More than half of the Gulf veterans seen at the referral center reported intolerances in all three categories, chemical inhalants, foods, and drugs or food drug combinations. Um, what this really shows is sort of a generalized pharmacologic intolerance that these individuals seem to have developed. Uh, responses at, at low levels, things that would not bother the ordinary person and don't, had not bothered these individuals previously, now were, seem to be triggering symptoms in them. Most patients will not report such intolerances to their physicians. Generally, they will focus on describing their symptoms, such as headaches or irritability. Even if they were to tell their physicians that they were experiencing confusion or nausea while driving, it is unlikely that either they or their doctors would entertain the notion that their symptoms might be triggered by exposure to traffic exhaust. And yet that's exactly what many veterans and the civilians exposed to organophosphates tell us. There are now several studies, in addition to our own, linking chronic multi-system symptoms to organophosphate or carbamate exposure. These agents have been <coughs> implicated in similar illnesses and intolerances in pesticide-exposed casino workers, uh, an attorney whose home was exterminated, and other persons exposed to organophosphates. A recent European study involving nine countries revealed other cases of new onset intolerances following exposure to various pesticides. Again, these individuals have multi-system kinds of symptoms. Thirty years ago, Tabor Shaw and Cooper in California described a group of agricultural workers with acute organophosphate pesticide poisoning, some of whom developed persistent symptoms. Following their acute exposure, nearly 20 percent reported that even a whiff of pesticides make them, made them feel ill. A number of the workers quit working with agricultural chemicals for this very reason. In 1961, uh, in Germany, Spiegelberg described persistent multi-system symptoms among Germans who had worked in chemical weapons production during World War II. Notably, symptoms. Thirty years ago, Tabor, Shaw, and Cooper in California described a group of agricultural workers with acute organophosphate pesticide poisoning, some of whom developed persistent symptoms. Following their acute exposure, nearly 20 percent reported that even a whiff of pesticides make them, made them feel ill. 
A number of the workers quit working with agricultural chemicals for this very reason. In 1961, uh, in Germany, Spiegelberg described persistent multi-system symptoms among Germans who had worked in chemical weapons production during World War II. Notably, he also described nuance and intolerances for alcohol, nicotine, and me medications among these workers. Thus, there is accumulating evidence linking organophosphate-type compounds with chronic illness and new onset intolerances in a subset of exposed persons. This unusual symptom of new onset chemical food and drug intolerances appears to be a unifying theme. It would be difficult to imagine that so many people with identifiable exposures would invent such a bizarre complaint. It's a bit of a coincidence. Many of these individuals now avoid fragrances they once enjoyed, no longer fill up their own gas tank or drive where there is heavy traffic exhaust because they feel too ill if they do these things. And they've given up formerly favorite foods such as pizza or chocolate because they feel sick when they eat them. Taken together, these observations by our own group and by other researchers suggest that we may be dealing with an entirely new mechanism for disease, one we have nicknamed toxicant-induced loss of tolerance, or TILT. A yet-to-be-proven mechanism of disease is a theory of disease, hence we have dubbed this the TILT theory of disease. TILT appears to involve two steps, initiation and triggering. First, after a single acute or multiple low-level exposures to a pesticide, solvent, or other chemical, a subset of those exposed appear to lose their prior natural tolerance for a variety of common exposures such as tobacco smoke, fragrances, engine exhaust, and gasoline. Following initiation, very low levels of many common substances trigger their symptoms, including not only chemicals but also various foods, medications, alcoholic beverages, and caffeine. Symptoms generally involve multiple organ systems and wax and wane in a seemingly unpredictable manner. Ironically, patients may be completely unaware of these intolerances because of a, of a phenomenon called masking. If an individual were intolerant of multiple substances, chemicals, foods, drugs, and so on, but they were exposed to these substances one after another during the day, then that person's responses to these exposures might overlap in time. So that at any given point in time, that person might be feeling ill, like they had chronic flu or chronic fatigue, but they would be unable to tell which exposure was triggering their symptoms. In effect, there would be so much background noise that the signal was hidden, the relationship to any particular exposure. This is what is meant by masking. To determine whether the Gulf veterans' current health problems are now being triggered and thus perpetuated by everyday chemical exposures, physicians need to be able to minimize background chemical noise or unmask their patients. <laughs> physicians and researchers attending two federally sponsored workshops on the health effects of low-level chemical exposures have recommended that double-blind placebo-controlled testing of patients in an environmentally controlled hospital ward be conducted in order to determine whether such low-level intolerances do in fact occur. As you can see, this is an area of contention among physicians. To accomplish this, use of an environmental medical unit has been proposed. This is a hospital unit in which chemical exposures would be controlled to the lowest levels practicable by air filtration and use of construction materials and furnishings that don't release low levels of chemicals into the air. I know Congressman Sanders uh, has uh, been involved with the carpeting issue. That's one example. One wouldn't put new carpeting in a, such a unit. And of course, many hospitals do that. So you have to control those kinds of exposures if you're going to test people adequately for low level sensitivities. An analogy will help illustrate the need for such a facility. Suppose we wanted to determine whether headaches in a coffee drinker, and again, many of these people are sensitive to caffeine, were due to caffeine. It wouldn't tell us much if we were to simply have this person drink a cup of coffee and say how they felt. We would first need to have the person stop all caffeine for about a week. If he experienced withdrawal symptoms, headache, fatigue, irritability, that would be a hint that caffeine could be a problem for him. If symptoms resolved after a week of avoiding all caffeine, that would provide further evidence. Then, once his symptoms had cleared, we could give him a cup of coffee and see how it made him feel. And of course, for research, you would do that in a blinded, placebo-controlled way. Failure to have this patient at a clean, caffeine-free baseline prior to challenge would likely result in a false negative caffeine challenge. And that's why you have to get rid of the background noise, if you will, eliminate exposures prior to testing. By analogy, placing ill Gulf veterans in a conventional exposure chamber, the kind that are available in most universities uh, or many universities, and exposing them to a few parts per million of some chemicals may produce misleading results. 
On the other hand, if they were to remain in an environmental medical unit for a few days beforehand and their symptoms resolved, one could then test them to determine which exposures were triggering their symptoms. Without carefully conducted studies of this kind, questions concerning the role of ongoing low-level exposures in perpetuating the veteran's symptoms are unlikely to be resolved. Although research using an environmental medical unit has been proposed to the Department of Defense, Department of Veterans Affairs, and the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, studies of this kind have not yet been funded. While Congress authorized partial funding for such a project two years ago, and the Department of Defense agreed to provide the remaining sum, an environmental unit still has not been constructed. Until this tool is made available to physicians, Gulf veterans are likely to remain in their current catch-22 of being required to show objective evidence of their disability and having no means by which to do so. In summary, the illnesses of many Gulf veterans and civilians exposed to organophosphates and other chemicals share a strikingly similar pattern. Multi-system symptoms that wax and wane in time and loss of prior tolerance for chemicals, foods, and drugs. This pattern appearing in different groups, chemically exposed groups, but different demographically, provides evidence, albeit circumstantial, for an emerging new theory of dis disease described as toxic and induced loss of tolerance. Confirmation or refutation of this theory rests upon careful evaluation of patients in an environmental medical unit. Results of studies in such a unit would benefit not only those patients admitted to the unit, but also other veterans and civilians by helping to elucidate mechanisms. Scientific understanding of these mechanisms can be expected to lead to more effective treatments and prevention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Um, you know, I think we're going to be fine for your flight, but whenever you have to go, just let me know. Dr. Padilla? Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, it is indeed an honor to be here today. I am pleased to have the chance to tell you about my research and other publications regarding the potential long-term health effects of exposure to organophosphorus compounds. As I said, my training is in the area of biochemistry, specifically neurochemistry, and for the last 15 years I have conducted research at the National Health and Environmental Effects Research Laboratory in North Carolina. I study the toxic mechanisms of organophosphate pesticides, and my research provides guidance, hopefully, to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency for use in the risk assessment of anticholinesterase pesticides. I have served on a scientific review board convened by the DOD to judge and rank Wait a minute. Let me say this first sentence. I am not an expert on Gulf War illnesses, nor on um, warfare nerve agents, but I have served uh, on a scientific review board convened by the Department of Defense to judge and rank Gulf War illness research proposals submitted to the DOD for funding. I am, however, well versed in the area of organophosphate toxicology and the toxic effects precipitated by these pesticides on mammalian species, including humans. The structure and mode of action of nerve agents and organophosphate pesticides are similar. Both classes of compounds are organophosphates, and their primary mechanism of action is the inhibition of acetylcholinesterase. Acetylcholinesterase stops the action of acetylcholine, an essential neurotransmitter in the central and peripheral nervous systems, the neuromuscular junction, and other areas of the peripheral nervous system. Because the majority of signs and symptoms which occur when an animal or human is exposed to organophosphate pesticides or carbamate pesticides usually abate when the acetylcholinesterase activity returns to normal, organophosphate and carbamate pesticides are assumed to be relatively safe because at sublethal dosages they only precipitate short-term reversible effects. There are, however, indications that exposures to organophosphate pesticides may produce residual adverse effects, and I'm going to consider a few. For instance, it is known, as already mentioned, that members of a subset or the, or of the organophosphate compounds cause organophosphate-induced delayed neuropathy, a bilateral neuronal degeneration of the peripheral and central nervous systems resulting in a numbness and incoordination in the arms and legs, which appears about two weeks after exposure to those organophosphates and may be permanent. I want to add a parenthetical here. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency tests all pesticides on the market to make sure or to 
make sure as much as possible that they do not produce OPIDN, organophosphate-induced delayed neuropathy. I mean, there are compounds that do it, and most of the ones that are in the literature here are old, old-time compounds that are not on the market, okay? So it's not as if there are pesticides out there that have not been tested. This is called the hen test, and you basically administer high doses of these compounds to chickens to see if they develop incoordination in the legs. And that's to make sure that these don't get on the market. Although much research... And we choose chickens because of their nervous system? Or? Well, that's a very good question. Um, much of my research, rats work. It's just easy in chickens to tell when they're, they're walking on two legs. It's much easier to tell when chickens are uncoordinated. <laughs> <laughs> It's true? Okay. What do you mean? Hey, no, she's yes, busy. it's true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Although much research has been conducted on the subject, there is no experimental, and by that I mean published, evidence that the commonly used nerve agents cause this type of peripheral neuropathy. There is, however, evidence from my own laboratory, as well as others, that exposure to, one, to more than one cholinesterase-inhibiting compound may cause this neuronal degeneration when exposure to any of these compounds alone would produce much less or no damage at all. It must be noted that, to my knowledge, that none of these studies, these synergistic type of studies, has been conducted with nerve agents, um, only with other classes of organophosphate compounds. And when I say to my knowledge, I mean in the published literature. Um, and I go through a little bit of the review of the literature from 30 years ago, which I'm going to skip over and go to the more recent studies in the last 15 years. Some more recent studies, which, include the which included the appropriate control controls, indicate that there may be long-term health effects associated with exposure to organophosphate pesticides. Studies that compared the effects of poisoned pesticide workers and control workers long after the poisoning episodes, this is six months to three years later revealed that previously poisoned workers showed changes in motor skills, some academic skills, and or attention, visuomotor function, and mood. One of the authors concluded that, quote, results clearly indicate that there are chronic neurological sequelae to acute organophosphate poisoning, end quote, and cautioned that one must conduct the appropriate tests to reveal these changes. There have, however, been few studies which address the effects of low-level, long-term exposures to organophosphate pesticides. Recently, such a study was published which compared the neuropsychological effects in sheep farmers who were regularly exposed to organophosphates with the control group of quarry workers. It was concluded that the sheep farmers were impaired on tests which assessed sustained attention and speed of knowledge of information processing, but there were no differences between the two groups with regard to short-term memory or learning. Um, are there animal studies that also suggest that exposure to organophosphate pesticides produce long-term effects? There are reports that one or multiple exposures to commonly used organophosphate pesticides may alter neurochemical endpoints. Months after one exposure to a large dosage of chlorpyrifos, which is Dersban, experimental animals appeared normal until they were challenged with a drug which interacted with the cholinergic nervous system. It may be, therefore, that the adverse long-term effects due to this exposure were silent until the brain chemistry was pharmacologically challenged. Moreover, work in my laboratory during the last five years has indicated that one or multiple exposures to the <coughs> organophosphate pesticide phenthion may cause persistent, possibly permanent, alterations in the biochemistry of the retina. My conclusion is that there is evidence in the human literature, which is now supported by an emerging animal literature, of long-term effects of acute, relatively high-level exposure to organophosphate pesticides. What is not clear is whether a poisoning episode has to occur to cause these clinically significant, persistent effects. This is a very important question that needs to be considered in relation to the Gulf War illnesses. And that is whether repeated low-level exposure to organophosphates would also produce these effects. Both the human literature and the experimental animal literature is very sparse with regard to studies of subchronic exposure to low levels of organophosphate pesticides or nerve agents. The community of science, scientists who study the health effects of anticholinesterase pesticides is just beginning to study this question. I thank you again for inviting me to this hearing, and I'm glad to answer any questions that you may have. I thank all of you for your patience and
sitting through a long day. I, your testimony really is quite important, and I'm trying to um, get a handle on um, how it relates to um, our concern of whether our troops were exposed and the symptoms and so on. I was expecting something a little different, but the fact that I was expecting something a little different doesn't mean that that's... It, uh, it may be uh, even more important that I got this testimony the way I got it from you all. What I'm uh, focusing on your, your last point, um, Dr. Padilla, it strikes me that what I hear you saying, and I think I maybe hear all of you saying, and then you can correct me, that um, you seem to imply that exposure to certain chemicals over time will dissipate and that maybe four or five years from now you won't have the problems that you have in the short run. And then the whole concept of poisoning and what constitutes poisoning. Um, and so what I'm trying to get a handle on is here we have troops whose illnesses seem to get worse, not better. And the testimony that I'm hearing from you all is, um, is, is not totally connecting with that. I guess I didn't understand what you thought I said. You right thought now? I said what? What I thought, what I thought you said at the end was that, uh, that exposure over time to certain chemicals, uh, that there's a, uh, I'll just read the, the last line, taken in concert, the properly controlled human studies indicate that humans who have experienced acute, high-level exposure to organ, organ, uh, organophosphates, mm -hmm. uh, pesticides may experience lasting deficits uh, for as long as two to three years after the poisoning episode. What is not clear is whether a poison episode has to occur to cause these clinically scientific persistent effects. No. What I meant there was people have only looked as far as two or three years after okay. the poisoning episode. Okay. That's considered an extremely long time since the effects are supposed to reverse in a matter of days to weeks. I made an assumption that uh, chemical exposure and the illnesses that relate it to chemical exposure is a science that is... Uh, particularly advanced and that we have a lot of experts around the country. And, and I'm beginning to get the feeling that this is a whole new area of study. Is this accurate? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. You know, you asked me that question and I said it isn't new. But yes, it really is new. And I think the confusion is bec between... Before you, about give me your answer, before you give me an answer, I just want to know, is that, is that true as far as you're concerned, Dr. Miller? Then I'm going to come right back to you, Doctor. Which part true? Is it true that this is a science that, I mean, that there, there's not a, 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 this is not as established a science uh, uh, as other areas of healthcare? Low level exposure causing these kinds of intolerances and, and then just being perpetuated. Now, and just how you, treat, how you treat people exposed to chemical, uh, chemicals? It's well developed in certain areas, but not in this particular area with this particular effect. Not being, with anticholinesterases. I'm sorry? Not with anticholinesterases. I mean, it's thought that they go in, they inhibit acetylcholinesterase. If you live through that and you recover, you're fine. That, that is what has been thought up until this point. That's why this human literature that I was quoting is within the last 15 years, people have gone back and looked at pesticide workers that have been poisoned. Yeah. 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 And they said, you know, that, but, but, that's what they're looking for. <laughs> so I'm going to come to you in just a sec, but I did interrupt. And I just, uh, um, but what I'm just saying to you is my expectation was different. My expectation was... I mean, I get the feeling like we're almost having to argue who's right within the field rather than there being accepted principles that we all agree to. And, that, and I almost, if I don't read into it, that I, I also get the feeling that within the medical community, some may discount people who are supposedly experts in this area. That, that well, you know, I see your expression, but, you know. Well, uh, let me say that when I see someone bring a book up here to have to prove to me that what he's saying might be true. I get a little suspicious. I think there is uh, a great deal of dispute about this, but I think one of the reasons is not because of the doctors, but because of the people who make pesticides and whatnot um, have always contended that uh, physicians are alarmist about this, about the potential for long-term hazard to organophosphates. I think the three of us more or less agree that there is some potential within a subpopulation who is exposed to organophosphates for long-term neurological and immune uh, damage. 
I, I, I think you all do, do agree. Yeah, Dr. Well, there, I, I think there's a, a critical issue here, and that is, do you have to have an initially acute exposure with, with the classical symptoms of organophosphate poisoning, real poisoning, before you get delayed effects? Uh, and the only paper I know of, and they may correct me if I'm wrong, with humans saying that you don't have to have those kinds of acute things is the one that we did where we said people had all of these flu-like symptoms with their initial exposure event, and yet these people are very disabled. Eighty percent of them can't work full time any longer, and this was seven or eight years down the road. I'm not talking a couple of years down the road, seven or eight years down the road. It's longer than the Gulf veterans have been. Uh, okay. There's a second article by Nanda in the Indian Journal of Medicine that says you do not have to have acute symptoms, or perhaps they're so subtle they're not noticed, mm -hmm. but you can progress to get chronic symptoms which involve not only the nervous system but the immune system. And the immune system involvement may be what is causing the progression and the chronic nature of this illness. But there are a lot of unknowns around that. I mean, but there are a lot of unknowns. This is not a well-studied area. That's right. This is not on agreed right on now. universally. Okay. Well, let me just say to you that that's surprising to me that this is not a well-studied area. I mean, I it mean, is. I can't tell you how surprising it is to uh, me. Yeah. In this day and age, I would think this it is. would be. No, you're right. You're right. It is amazing, particularly that we've produced millions of pounds of this stuff, and we, in fact, in this country, have 1.2 million pounds of organophosphate serin and other highly toxic chemicals in unstable conditions that we can't even get rid of, and yet we don't know the potential hazards and long-term effects of them. Yes, it's very surprising and very disturbing. We, we do know that. Tua, you've been very patient. M Mr. Chairman, uh, first of all, the, the agents that we're talking about here, the uh, organophosphate compounds that we're talking about here, were developed by the Wehrmacht. Uh, they've been tested in the Nazi death camps and at Fort Detrick, which is not, they're not particular particularly large contributors to the uh, scientific literature on this issue. But there were tests of low-level agent exposures to U.S. forces that occurred from the late 60s or late 50s, excuse me, through uh, the mid-70s when Congress outlawed that type of testing. And the Department of Defense is quick to point out that uh, nearly 90 percent of these folks uh, have no serious health problems as a result of their exposures. They're also quick to point out that 79 percent have good to excellent health. Well, this is a the cup is half full, the cup is half empty kind of an analogy because this means that more than 10 percent have serious health problems after their exposures, and these were young men who were in the military. And 21 percent would describe their health as fair to poor. This was in testing that we did at Fort Detrick and at other facilities in the United States on nearly 6,000 U.S. soldiers. We exposed them to these chemicals. And we're looking at an, a, an approximate percentage of what we're seeing right now in the Gulf War veterans uh, getting sick, so that there may be an actual genetic predisposition or sensitivity to the low-level exposures. But furthermore, uh, something that Dr. Padilla brought up was that um, that combinations of these compounds can cause synergistic effects. And we know that the troops were taking the carbamate, or carbamate inhibitor, carbamate cholinesterase inhibitor, peridostigmine, as a nerve agent pretreatment. These were the pills they were taking Correct. to combat chemicals? At the same time, they would have been exposed to these compounds. And there has been published research indicating synergism between the organophosphates and these kinds of uh, medications. So. The, the issue in its sort of benign sense, there's not much study on these kinds of compounds, the, 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 the ones that are designed not to kill insects but to kill people. Yeah. Uh, but the clinical or the, in the scientific data that we have available indicate that there's a problem. Furthermore, there's been some occupational studies done of people who work in these kinds of facilities. And there is clinical incidence of increased illnesses very similar to those that the veterans are experiencing. What we don't know is exactly why the people who are exposed to these compounds exhibit the symptoms that they do in the long term. So the cause and effect relationship, the link is there. We just don't know. But it's a clinical link, not an, uh, an ideological link. We don't know what is causing it to happen. We just know that the literature is reporting, in many cases, that it is happening. I hear you. Right. This is a terrible analogy, the best I can do to illustrate a point. We have a very long street in Stanford, Connecticut, where I live. It's a, it's a uh, two-lane each way. There are probably 
from North Stanford to get downtown, there are probably 12 lights, 13 lights, and you have to stop. And sometimes the storm comes and they mechanically get out of line and it takes people so long to get down because they don't get to go, they have to stop at each light. And during the course of this, we found out that Stanford wasn't using digital equipment, it was still using mechanical equipment. And we found out the reason why was the person who designed these systems, the only thing he could work on was the, was the mechanical systems that go back 20, 30 years, 40 years. And, and, um, and I, I get the feeling that maybe one of the problems is that the people in the VA, potentially, this is a whole other area that isn't their, their stick. That's absolutely right. You're absolutely right. They just aren't uh, aware of this. And what I was trying to explain is that the reason they're not aware of this, it isn't their fault. It's because, and I understand this is complicated, psychiatry and neurology split about 30 years ago, leaving a hole in our knowledge of the interaction between mind and body. The immune system is stuck in between the mind and the body and pl is the player in creating these chronic neuroimmune disorders that are secondary to organophosphate and other multiple chemical exposures. Do you, do you think that is a potential problem at the VA, that you simply don't have people trained in this area? I think there, there's a lack of data in the toxicology literature so that you can say that people who have these very low exposures to pesticides but other classes of, of solvents and, and, and various other chemicals can lead to chronic ill effects. That has not been studied very well. It simply has, there's very little but, literature on it. But with it. all due respect, not being studied well means you have doctors who aren't focused on it a, as well. I that's, mean, that's they, they true. both go hand. You know, that's you true, go, but physicians rely upon what's published in the literature already. Well, I, mean, I don't want to well, read too much into this, but I just, uh, Dr. Padilla, do, do you think that this is part of the challenge that we have, that simply you don't have enough people at the VA Absolutely. and elsewhere that are focused in on this kind of issue and that, that this is still somewhat of a of a controversial area of medical study? Well, I, I would, you know, I guess in, in my opinion, definitely. I don't know the human literature as well as I know the experimental animal literature for pesticides. But, yeah, it's emerging. I mean, most of what I was talking about was research that's done in the last 10 years. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Stephen Joseph, the Assistant DOD Secretary for Health Affairs, who we've to referred to, told the subcommittee, quote, chronic symptoms or physical manifestations do not later develop among persons exposed to low levels of chemical nerve agent who did not first exhibit acute symptoms of toxicity. Do you believe this to be true or not true? Not true. Our, our research suggests otherwise, but the proof is, is, is still out. Okay. Um, one of the things that has disturbed me as I've been writing my testimony and, and answering questions is what is meant by low level. That's fair, but... Uh, but do you... You know, I, I'll tell you oh, what... I have something else I want to say. Sure, sure. Actually, that wasn't a question to be answered. It's just a statement. Okay, but I want an answer to this question. I know. Okay. Um, in my work with rats, uh, you, can, you can poison a rat with a pesticide, and if you walk in and look at the rat, they look perfectly normal. And later on, they will have deficits two or three okay. weeks later. One of the questions that I would like to bring up, just with my own work, is these... Troops were taking pyridostigmine, which is designed to dampen the effects of nerve agents, it's my understanding. I mean, okay. they're taking uh, yeah. pyridostigmine so that they have a reversible inhibitor of acetylcholinesterase at their active site so that a permanent inhibitor, the nerve gas, can't get into that active site and, and kill the acetylcholinesterase and, and might cause it. Unfortunately, that does not work with sarin. Well, and sarin was but, the major OP around. But what I'm but, saying but is, but what I'm saying is, is if they were taking the pyridostigmine, that it may dampen the acute effects. I mean, that has been what we've oh, learned in the laboratory. Interesting. So rather than protecting them, it could simply well, it masks the fact that they were uh, actually being affected by it. Well, it does protect them. <laughs> it would protect them to a from degree, but it would also mask it for them. They would, it would, they wouldn't exhibit. Uh, certain visible well, I know stuff. that we, we don't use pyridostigmine, but we use physostigmine in the laboratory when, for the, just this purpose, to, to mask the acute effects at the end. Oh, but, but I think what you're saying is something significant. I'm putting it in my layman terms, and then you tell me if I'm correct. What I think I hear you saying okay. is, there is in the process, I think it's a very significant point. I think a lot of points have been significant, but I, I think what I hear you collectively saying, and you're articulating it, that in the process of taking these pills, 
but I call them pills, they mask, mask the fact that our troops may have actually been exposed. Is well, that? Yeah, it's my under, yes. It's okay. my understanding that pyridostigmine would, would, it's the idea is to mask the effects of the nerve agent. Right. But also, they would produce some of the effa same effects that the nerve agent would produce. And right. so you either have an extremely high baseline or it would mask the effects of the nerve agent. I believe. I mean, it's yeah. I uh, can I add something here? Sure. Uh, the pyridostigmine protects uh, m many of the acetylcholine sites, but there is a site called the neurotarget esterase site, which is supposed to be where this OPIDN, organophosphate-induced delayed neurotoxicity, the the chronic condition starts. These sites are on peripheral and central neurons and on lymphocytes. And it is not known if pyridostigmine, phosphostigmine protects that site. In fact, it probably does not. So it just masks. And that's why when you asked me, do there have to be acute symptoms? Give me one second. It's not required, but it's, yeah. That's why when you asked me, do there have to be acute symptoms, I said no, because the acute symptoms can be masked by other things. Okay. For let instance, me, pyridostigmine. Me, uh, and then I'm going to ask a, um, the minority staff has a, a question too, and there's no one from the minority to ask the question. I'd like her to be able to. Uh, but first off, on the, in the internet, there was a report on possible effects of organophosphate low-level nerve agent exposure, uh, and this is DoD. And um, at the end of it, they say, "We therefore conclude that there is no credible evidence for chronic illnesses caused by exposure to organophosphate nerve agents." at concentrations too low to produce signs or symptoms of acute and so on. And it says, while further research on animals might contribute some information to the general database on toxicity, it is unlikely in the extreme that such research would enhance our understanding of Gulf War illnesses. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a document of 91396. Could you respond to that? Yeah. Uh, actually, the DoD has sponsored a experiment by Prendergast and Buttafusco that's going on right now in Georgia. And well, I they, know they're doing that, but I want to know what you think. Yeah, I, I think they're absolutely wrong, and I think their own experiment has demonstrated they're wrong. Well, but just because they're experimenting doesn't mean that they think they're wrong. They may do the experiment to prove they're right. No, the experiment proved that they were wrong. Okay. Their own it's experiment proved that they were wrong about that contention. I've talked to Dr. Prendergast and Dr. Butterfusco, and they exposed uh, rats to minute amounts of new organophosphate neurotoxin, and uh, those that, even though they, some did not have acute effects, they went on to have the chronic neurological problems, and they still have them months and months later, which is a long time for a rat. Dr. Miller, could you comment on this? I may not have read enough to make you, but I, I think you get the gist of their attitude. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's premature for anyone to say that low levels of organophosphates can't cause chronic health problems. I think there's a lot of literature now suggesting that's a, quite a, a possibility, and there are ways to approach that question scientifically. Dr. Padilla? I agree. Okay, you agree in questioning the statement? I agree with Dr. Miller. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tewitt? I've actually looked at that document quite closely, and there are all sorts of method flaws in the, in the document itself. First of all, they don't say who wrote it, which really kind of bothers me that they're yeah. using the Internet and taxpayers' money as a bully pulpit to, to publish propaganda. Uh, they talk about leading experts in the field, and then they reference a study being done by one individual up at Fort Detrick. It, it, I might just say it said it's prepared by the health affairs prepared for health affairs by the Persian Gulf Illnesses Investigation Team. That's a lot of individuals. I'd like to know who prepared it so that, you know, we can at least evaluate that individual's credentials to, to prepare that kind of a document. But they open up by saying uh, one of the assumptions that we have to do is assume that all the organophosphate nerve agents should be uh, looked at as a group since they all produce similar effects. And then later on in the same report, they go on to discredit one of the scientists who have done some research in this area because he considers all of the particular organophosphate compounds as a single group to determine their effects. So, I mean, the, the method of that report is, it shows that it was thrown together very quickly. There was very little scientific review, and they're citing one expert who is their own expert in terms of the, uh, the leading national experts on this issue. So, you know, it causes some concern when that's what's being circulated in, in the uh, veterans community. That's what's being given the veterans is information on what may be wrong with them. Uh, without any kind of review, without any kind of methodical soundness in, in the research itself or in the paper itself. 
Thank you. Um, Sheriff Phelps has a question or two or three or four, whatever. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to ask some questions on behalf of the Democratic members. Uh, Dr. Bombswagger, was it your testimony that... You're just showing off that you can say his name. Yeah, Bombswagger. <laughs> was Very it your good. testimony <laughs> in 1993 that it was VA policy that uh, Gulf vets were not exposed to neurotoxins? That is what their policy was. It was their policy. It was their belief. They had been told that by the DOD. They believed it, and they expected us to believe it. So it was the federal policy, not necessarily the uh, policy of that particular uh, West Correct. Los Angeles outpost. Correct. I don't believe it was West LA's policy. It was the, the, it was the dictate that had been handed down to them. That we were not to think that way. Did you happen to note how it influenced their treatment of patients that came oh, in? Absolutely. Could you it forced them to think of these patients as either psychiatric cases or only to look at the you know, musculoskeletal or gastrointestinal uh, aspects of this disease when they are not the core symptoms. The core symptoms are loss of self, loss of sexuality, loss of identity, loss of ability to relate to others, brainstem signs due to lack of acetylcholine. Now, these are the core signs which weren't looked at because they had denied. Got it. But you did also that say that, that you were not inhibited in any way in pursuing your research in that No, area. I, they did not dissuade me in any way. Uh, I, yeah, Dr. Miller, I was going to ask, because I know yes. that you're on a special committee right now. And yes. has that policy changed, or can you describe it? I don't know of any such policy. policy. Um, and I do know from my consulting at the Houston Regional Referral Center that um, I was given free reign to look into these questions. I raised the question of chemical exposures, nerve agent, because there were a number of cases where people would report something like a bunker or a scud exploding, and they'd say that soon after that they developed symptoms. So we raised those issues. Um, but again, with the, the constant denial that there was any agent in the Gulf, and with the feeling that you have to have acute toxic symptoms to have problems, no one really pursued it as, as the leading hypothesis, but it was not denied that that was a possibility. It was just very low on the list of priorities. It was just disavowed but not denied. So in your current capacity on this special committee, what's been the evolution of this type of thinking? Uh, we, we've had a number of witnesses on this very question, as you have, uh, Jim Toot, prepared before our committee. Um, we've asked DOD witnesses to come and talk to us and show us some of the maps, and, and I think this is scheduled for our next committee meeting. Um, I, I think there, there are members who, on the committee who said, no, it couldn't possibly be organophosphates because there, was no, there were no acute symptoms, and that has been conventional medical wisdom. But a number of us have pursued it pretty aggressively, and we're continuing to explore just as you are. Did you, uh, you heard the testimony of the first panel? Yes, I did. Would you describe any of their symptoms as um, indicators of organophosphate exposure? Very, very mild exposure. For example, the numbness around the mouth is something I would be very suspicious of. Um, the symptoms that we have in, in the me, I just want to identify suspicious mm -hmm. that it happened, suspicious mm -hmm. that it was related to chemical exposure. Right. Which? But you see, there's also something called perioral numbness that can happen when a person is anxious. Okay. Okay, so yeah. it's not clear. That's not a, a, a symptom or a sign that, that would be pathognomonic for that, for organophosphate exposure. But you would think about it. I would think about it. Um, the symptoms that I showed you that civilians have had that are not acute organophosphate exposure symptoms but are flu-like, um, I hear that in many of the veterans. But I should also say that not all the veterans were necessarily um, became ill right at that point. There are, there are veterans who got ill, and they, they attribute it specifically to the protostigmine bromide by itself. And whether it was with the nerve agent or not, I don't know. But there were some that got sick back in August before the war ever started, and that was after taking protostigmine bromide. There are others who became ill when the Saudi trucks came through spring. And we know there were organophosphate pesticides used by the Saudi trucks, uh, and those are unspecified. No one knows how much or specifically which compounds were used because those were contracted. And then there are other people who didn't get sick until they got back to the United States. I think specifically of a couple of veterans, one of whom took a job as an exterminator, and he became ill, and he was using organophosphate pesticides. Right. And yet, because he had served in the Gulf, he thought it was, or he thought it was due to his ser service in the Gulf, and maybe that contributed to it. But these are very hard things to know. Depends it's hard to know yeah, the, the relationship between any particular exposure and symptoms when, we, when these things don't leave footprints. This is not like dealing with lead 
or DDT where you can measure it in the body years later. These things come and they're gone and appear to leave whatever damage behind. Yeah. How would you uh, respond, Dr. Miller, to Mr. Tewitt's testimony that uh, there were thousands of vets who experienced flu-like symptoms and rashes after a particular uh, bombing episode? I, I find his analysis very compelling. Um, again, there is always a, a dose issue. Was the dose sufficient to cause this problem? And I think we're in, in a very ill-defined area right now. Let me now. just interrupt there. That's your point about low level, high level. What's low yes. level? Yeah. Yes. Could I say something about that? I, I just yes. You continue. Yes, you may. Yeah, uh, uh, the, yeah. the um, uh, literature is, as has been pointed out, very new. But uh, it has been pointed out by uh, Abu Dona that hexane, which is a major component of heavy oil, will potentiate neurotoxic effects of organophosphates. And we had these uh, organophosphates mixed in with tremendous amounts of uh, uh, petroleum products and hydrocarbons, which may have made them not only stick around, but which may have made them far more toxic than they might have ordinarily been. Would exposure, uh, Dr. Dio, if you would, would exposures occur, say, for example, if Mrs. Kaplan handled her husband's clothing or other belongings, would you see the type of, would they exhibit organophosphate uh, poisoning? That's a very interesting question. Um, I am not aware of a lot in the literature about one person's clothing poisoning another person's clothing, you know. I'm or the just person not, who handled that. Yes, clothing. or the person that handled yeah. it. There, uh -huh. There's uh, quite a bit in agricultural workers about them taking their clothes home and other people being exposed to their clothes, which may have organophosphates on that, and through skin contact, because it's rapidly absorbed through the, the skin, they can develop poisoning. Again, my understanding is that it's clothing and equipment that have been tested so far haven't shown any organophosphates, but then again, they may degrade after a period of time, and it has been five years since the war. So I think it's, there, there's so many uncertainties in no, this but area. I, I, I'd like to just pursue that, and I'm really happy that you're asking Cheryl the questions you're asking, Ms. Phelps, the questions you're asking, because uh, we didn't get into that issue. Um, is there scientific literature that sustains the, the concern that, uh, um, that clothing can transmit these uh, chemical uh, agents and that they can affect others? Primarily Where, via skin contact. If you touch them. If you touch them, right, obviously. Yes. But But with, with agricultural workers, yes. other family members who touch them then are affected by it. Yes, in clothing that has been saturated with an and organophosphate. And I'm, I'm going to come back to you, but I just want what to, I'm, what I'm beginning to hear, which is also something that's new to me, is that um, I made an assumption that if you were exposed to a chemical agent, that there would always be that trace of that chemical and that you would then, you would always have proof. So you're suggesting mm -hmm. that you might mm -hmm. not have proof uh, later on. That's you right. would have the effect, but not the proof of that agent. That's correct. Many of these mm -hmm. degrade fairly okay. quickly. Okay. Um, the question came up as to what constituted low-level exposure and, and what kind of exposure levels we're Why talking about. Why don't we get about. to that in a sec? I'll come back to that. Do you want to finish your mm -hmm. points? Actually, I, I want to switch gears for a second because, Dr. Bomswager, you're, in your written testimony, you said that every vet that you examined, that you diagnosed with Gulf War Syndrome, exhibited um, decreased vibration? Yeah. I don't know what that means. What is oh, that? in other words, when you, first of all, let me say that not every vet who is in the Gulf and has symptoms has Gulf War syndrome. I only mean those with the dysautonomia, with the unstable heart rate and blood pressure and body temperature. If you look at these individuals, what you see as a constant finding is when you hold the tuning fork to say their finger, uh, they lose the feeling of vibration before the average person will. Even though they may not be really very symptomatic, they are beginning to lose subtle parts of their sensory system. And that's part of the peripheral neuropathy you see in this OPIDN. Got it. And you examined how many um, vets over the course of uh, this research that you've I, I've uh, examined closely 15 veterans being able to do chemical analyses on 10 of them. I've looked uh, more superficially at about 50 now, and through uh, Denise Nichols, I've heard about the symptoms of several hundred, all of which support the contentions that I'm making. 
So of the 15 that you examined closely, which is the universe of your study, right. they all exhibit this? Absolutely, this all of them. So listening to the, the symptoms and the conditions that the first panel described, was there any indicator that they might also have that particular? I'm sure if we checked them for uh, vibration loss, they would all have a small amount. Now, it wouldn't, be, wouldn't knock your socks off, but they'd all have a tiny amount. But it's detectable. It is detectable. So should this then be a common factor in diagnosing Gulf Absolutely. Gulf disease? Absolutely. Just like the dysautonomia, body temperature, heart rate, abnormalities, But So you're saying all these things, the irregular heart rate. That's right. The they are there in the, all of them. These are, these are common factors. They're all common. These patients also have loss of libido, sex drive, double vision. Everyone. All of them. Everyone. So if you surveyed everyone who ever complained of Gulf War, uh, having some, some <clears throat> Gulf War related illness, they would exhibit these? these. No, I, I, think, I think you have to select those who actually have the physical symptomatology of the instability in their physiology, like the heart rate and the blood pressure instability. Now, there were some people who went to the Gulf, and I'm sure came back with psychiatric problems or other problems and don't have this. This seems to be a problem in about 10 to 20 percent of the population, as Mr. Toot has pointed out. But all 15? All of them who really have the core physiology, physiology would have these individual problems as well. Dr. Miller, would you comment on that, Those, that set of questions that I just asked Dr. Bomswather? Yeah, the um, neurological and cognitive testing that has been done at the VA by people who are doing that kind of thing. Uh, when they look with controls, hasn't demonstrated necessarily the same things, but I don't know whether they're doing exactly the same tests, the neurologists who have look at, looked at these patients. But fre frequently common tests, you know, looking for peripheral neuropathy and so on, don't reveal abnormalities. Again, um, he may be looking at something much more subtle. And the question is, you know, how, how significant is that relative to, let's say, a control group? And he feels it's significant. I didn't see significance bars, you know, p-values and so on on his data. I don't know if it's been published yet, but obviously any finding like that that's concrete would be of great interest. But I don't know of concrete findings of, of neurological abnormalities that have been published yet among the veterans. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Tewitt, you had a comment you want to make. Yeah, the issue came up about what constituted low-level exposures. And uh, along those lines, our chemical detectors were not designed to provide OSHA quality or EPA quality protection to the troops. They were designed for point detections to, de to identify chemical agent attacks. Yet these alarms continued to go off. Uh, and, and likewise with the check equipment, their field alarms were not designed to sit there and look at environmental exposures. They were designed to look at chemical agent attacks. So the issue of low level is, is a serious one. And in fact, our alarms don't go off until 1,000 times what is considered the permissible exposure limit in an eight-hour total weight average up at uh, Aberdeen Proving Ground for a, based on their material safety data sheets for a worker working there. So if we're looking at it from a laboratory perspective, at that level, one one thousandth of the amount that would uh, require the, the folks up at Aberdeen to wear a mask, um, they were being exposed to a thousand times more than that, being told to disregard the alarms, that, that it was neurotoxins in the air from the bombings, but it wasn't enough to hurt you. No. But yet they're concerned enough about the folks up at Aberdeen and the folks that work in an occupational setting with these compounds that they think that much less than that is harmful enough to hurt you. Well, you trigger a point that, that, that one of the things that I've wondered in our hearings is, does the military have a practice for its soldiers that we wouldn't allow for uh, everyday uh, citizens of this country in terms of exposure to certain types of chemicals. And in fact, are some of those soldiers under orders to utilize a chemical, I'm not talking about a chemical to kill, but a chemical to do some s uh, s type of service, uh, and, and they're actually under order to use it and in confined areas, which leads me to this, this point, and I, I, don't, I don't know what your answer is, but we had a constituent who died in Connecticut. His job was to use a chemical called lindane to spray soldiers, Iraqi s soldiers, who um, were captured. And he did it day in and day out. And he did it in a confined area. Uh, and he, he ultimately died of pancreas cancer. Uh, and one of his 
his child was born with some physical challenges. And they are convinced that he died of Lindane exposure. Now, is there anything that would give credibility to a, at least a concern about that? Is Lindane first a substance that we would, in the private sector, be very careful how it's used? Well, it's, it's not used in a lot of agricultural applications anymore. It, um, we don't allow it to be used. We don't allow it to be used in terms of uh, it's being used for delousing patients, getting rid of head lice. It is used in this country. There's a lot of concern about its effects. Uh, it's a chlorinated compound, chlorinated pesticide. Not an organophosphate. Not an organophosphate. Okay. So it's a completely different class. And I just want to add that I have... But still a substance that we're concerned about enough to want to regulate its use? Well, and in, in I've seen exactly the symptoms that we're talking about here in relationship to organophosphates in an individual who had a similar exposure to the one you described. Um, sh just this but, this but veteran who was delousing prisoners also and now has many chronic health complaints, intolerances, chemical intolerances, and so on. So it's not like there's one smoking gun. No, no there, there are other things. There isn't one Balfour syndrome. There are lots of m m maladies and there are lots of potential causes and the mixtures right. of chemicals and so on and, and how they relate to each other. I realize that, but, but, but the point is, I mean, picture this. Picture a person under orders to do something that in this country we would, OSHA would come in and sue the company. And, and a, a person under orders can't say no unless he's willing or she's willing to be court-martialed. And, and, you know, this is a factor. So that we're touching on a lot of issues. I, I, I believe that Dr. Murphy may want to respond at least to uh, one or two comments here. And, and uh, first off, we appreciate, Dr. Murphy, your willingness to stay and listen. I, I certainly appreciate it. So maybe you just want to make a comment for the record. And any of you who would like to just make a uh, uh, closing comment, and I just don't want you to miss your plane, <laughs> having waited so long. You all are wonderful. And someone who is clearly a journalist in this issue. Yes, Dr. Murphy. Uh, thank you for allowing me to make another sure. comment. I just wanted to clarify one of the points that was brought up by Dr. Baumswiger. There has never been a departmental policy against um, identifying or investigating neurotoxic exposure or chemical warfare agents. That may have been said. I'm not discounting, right. you know, the validity of the comment that was made to him. But it may have been a personal opinion of one physician at one medical center. VA has always said that we are looking at all exposures and including those in the consideration of the health effects against uh, on Persian Gulf. Let me just say that to you. I, I believe that would be true. But the only question is that there's a, sometimes a company culture. Uh, and the company culture, in some ways, is exhibited by the fact that even in your testimony, you're acknowledging that you were somewhat, uh, had the DOD pointed out sooner that our troops may have been exposed to chemicals, we might have started low level radiation studies sooner, I mean, low level studies sooner. And, and so it's, the, the, I, I think your point is well taken. There w certainly wouldn't and shouldn't be a policy. The question is, in some facilities, was there an attitude, uh, a, a company culture that kind of exhibited that comment? I, I have to say that I agree with Dr. Murphy. I don't think there was an agency-wide uh, right. uh, policy against there being Gulf War syndrome or uh, agency-wide conviction that organophosphates didn't matter. I think this is something that just crept into parts of the structure of the organization. And, and, and I would say, Dr. Murphy, we've had too much testimony from too many veterans that uh, have exhibited the same concern. So uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that this is changing and changing quickly uh, in the, it, throughout the system. But happy you testified. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, does anyone have a last word here? And then we'll get on our way. You, you know, you, you mentioned about, I guess, the, the, the culture. And one of the problems that we faced, I think, in some of the uh, boards that have met on this issue, on some of the review panels for grants, are people who feel very strongly in their scientific wisdom that these kinds of effects can't exist and that they're psychogenic. And in fact, some of these in individuals serve as expert witnesses uh, for corporations, for example, yeah, against these kinds of yeah. things. And it makes it very hard then to entertain proposals or ideas that are new. Well, you know, I have a little more sympathy. I would just say a little more sympathy for the Department of Veterans Administration for the fact that um, we are in an area where there are, isn't as much study and there seems to be medical warfare in some cases in terms of uh, what's uh, considered legitimate and what isn't. Uh, so it gives me a little bit of sympathy because there's got to be reasons to explain some of what I consider 
dysfunctional behavior on the part of a lot of different people yeah. on this issue. Um, yes. I also like to say that the symptoms of this are extremely subtle. And one of the reasons I was able to pick them up is that I'm both a psychiatrist and a neurologist, which most people are not. I understand. Dr. Miller, you've said your last word. And, and uh, um, Dr. Padilla, do you have any, any comment you want to make? Your testimony has been very helpful. And Mr. Tewitt as well. This has been a very interesting day. And uh, you would like to make one comment. It's got to be real short. Identify yourself again for the record. Uh, for the record, it's Denise Nichols, and I want to point out one thing. Uh, in the chemical logs that we have released um, through Paul Sullivan, uh, Georgia veterans, uh, Brigadier General Neal brought up in those regulations, I mean, in those uh, NBC logs from CINCOM, about the Belize, Italy, there was a combination there back in history, World War II, Dr. Jackson has identified that, too. The initial casualty figures from Belize, Italy, World War II, mustard, uh, I think a ship was uh, bombed, you know, and it mixed with oil. The initial casualties were not that great. But over time, it was a, a great number of casualties. And Dr. Jackson has researched that information, and it combines the idea of mixture of agents, and I think we need to look into that. Yeah, I think that's pretty been fairly well established. Mr. Stewart, do you have a closing comment? The only thing that I would suggest the committee to press for is that I've been told by elements both in the Department of Defense and the Presidential Advisory Committee that the CENTCOM still has not released um, segments of the NBC log to even those bodies investigating this issue, and I'm certain they probably haven't well, brought we'll, them into we'll this We'll follow up with a letter tomorrow on that issue. Happy I'm to have you. And you might take a look at the letter to make sure we're um, writing it the proper way to get the information we need to get. I've also been told that there is eight missing pages now from that log. Uh, well, we'll raise that.